And there we go. We are live. Uh, after many technical problems today, we're happy once and more to get started gaming again. I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One. This is Legends of the Drowned Isles Campaign 2, The Great Confusion, uh, a, uh, a homebrew 5th ed D&D campaign, which we realized today has been running as long as the first campaign we were running in this world of Omatia. Uh, thank you for, for watching. If you are, or you're either watching here on Twitch live, twitch.tv slash ENCAF1, or via YouTube, twitch.tv, uh, sorry, youtube.com slash ENCAF1. Look for the uh, the uh, Legend of the Drowned Isles playlist for everything, or Campaign 2, The Great Confusion, for uh, everything else. Uh, Hopefully, this is a different setup today, so hopefully we'll have a little bit more clear of video and audio. Uh, as I said, I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One. I am the GM, host, and uh, a crazy mad tinkerer slash cartographer slash world builder slash 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 bludgeoning damage uh, of this particular campaign. But I have been joined by my players, starting on my left with Silas. Hi, my name is Pat. I'm playing Silas Marsh, uh, Bardlock. Winner of a great contest. Yup, yup, yup. Uh, my name is Marie, and I play uh, Annie, who is a uh, rogue slash fighter uh, and very anxious for what's happening. Slash princess, slash runaway, slash... <laughs> slash not supposed to be here at all. <laughs> slash where are your parents? No. Hey, I'm Nax, and I'm playing Medric, half orc cleric, also a Phoenix champion. Sometimes, on fire. <laughs> and that's yeah. a good. Thing. Well, we alluded to it last session, uh, which was a little while ago. Apologies uh, for numerous life things getting in the way. Uh, last session was the great performance, a, the culmination of the uh, week, uh, week and a half long celebrations that were going on around town. Uh, where Circus Maximus had come to down, presenting all kinds of curious games and prizes, as well as some curious people. Uh, also, during that week, there was a, a, a sort of a side issue of a couple of friends of yours having gone missing, uh, who you rescued from a giant flying pancreas. You know, it sounds kind of silly when you say it out loud. Uh, but the great performance, uh, led by uh, Silas, one of uh, four different sets of performers, uh, was being interfered with, and as uh, Annie discovered, being interfered with by Sable, Sable Harquin, daughter of the Baron and Baroness Harquin. Uh, that led to a confrontation between uh, Sable and Annie and Captain Verendel, who was very surprised to be informed of Annie's true identity, not least of which also in conjunction with Sable's own true identity. That led him to be um, concerned. <laughs> he kind of walked off and hasn't been heard from since. The next event on the social calendar is a massive masked ball, which is being held at the Baron and Baroness's estate. That's due for the following night. Already Circus Maximus has started to pack up and uh, get its stuff ready for travel once more. There are still last-minute games and prizes that people have won, and uh, some people are also taking advantage of things like the, the Griffin Rides and the, uh, the uh, Emu uh, races that are going on as well. But many people are buzzing about the possibility of this party. Now, the party does have limited attendance. Uh, it is generally by, by invitation only, uh, Verendel has been invited and has asked uh, uh, Annie to be his uh, plus one. Uh, Mer Medric was invited and was um, told that his plus one would be uh, would be um, Melora Cartwright, partially by Ardwin Cartwright and partially by the very uh, demanding Melora, who sort of somewhat insisted upon it. Uh, and I believe Silas has a plan for potentially at attending, although was not specifically invited, uh, nor did he uh, oh. seek out a a uh, partner who was already invited. So a few additional business pieces of business before we get started with those new things. Um, a couple of things that are, are uh, a bit of retrocon or retcon uh, uh, in, uh, things from a couple of sessions ago. 
Uh, specifically, um, I took a look at the Pearl of Power and realized that it really wasn't something that anybody can use, which was not my intention. That was meant to be an item which is going to be used. So in Roll20, uh, you'll be able to find the Pearl of Wondrous Power, which is a, an upgraded version of that, which is what you actually found. It is a wondrous item, very rare, requires attunement by a spellcaster, so, that, so it's very rare as opposed to rare. Uh, and it has uh, the upgraded ability, while the pearl is in your person, you can use an action to speak its command word and regain one expended spell slot. So no longer as limit, limited by level as it was before because that made it less than useful. And once the pearl is used, it can't be used again until the next dawn, so that part's the same. Um, so that might make it available for Silas to use, although Medric also could use it um, to uh, regain a cleric spell slot. Um, I'd so, have to attune to it, though. But <laughs> uh, it, it is, does require attunement, um, but is very yeah. useful. Um, and I think that's it, it's also Silas is already max attuned. It's going to be one of those things that once you start hitting the three attuned items levels, you start to be more strategic about the items you end up using. So if you feel like I'm going to need more spells, then you might go with that. Um, but that's up to you guys to use. You also do know additional spellcasters who might be able to use that if you feel um, that you want to include them within uh, the party in some other some other time. Uh, I also mentioned um, that there were additional prizes that were given for the performance, having gone so well. So on top of the money, as, as promised, to take of the door, which I think I already gave you the number. I'll, I'll have to... I don't nope. have it. Oh, I don't have it in front of me, um, so I will... We didn't distribute the prizes, basically. No, right. we don't know anything about the prizes or the money yet. Okay. Well, one prize you already know, which is the Instrument of Illusions, um, which was the the, uh, the guitar uh, of Illusions. That's something that will be directly your, your prize to use. Um, there will be a portion of the door, and I don't have that in front of me, so I don't want to contradict myself, but I believe it will be... Something in the order of of uh, of uh, three medium and six small uh, money, so direct considerable amount of money. In fact, I'm going to write that right now um, and see if I have if I remember it other otherwise. But one of the other things that happens is because they were so impressed with what you did, they decided to put together an additional package of rewards. The rewards were all donated by the various vendors who've been a part of the uh, Circus Maximus. Every single item comes with a little tag telling you which uh, vendor sold the item as well. Um, so in case you're ever interested in more of them, you know where to go. Although most of these vendors are traveling, they also have essentially their, their mailing address. So you can send off a request and after a certain period of time, additional um, additional. Uh, 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 items can be purchased. Uh, and I just realized that I didn't actually tie together <laughs> the proper uh, vendors with the prizes that I will have to do on the fly here. Um, so um, you will find uh, all of these as described in Roll20. Um, uh, Pat, Pat can't access that for right now, so I'll read out the descriptions as well of each of these things. But just the overall uh, thing, none of these, I believe, are attunement only, so anyone could actually use them. Um, and some of them are, in fact, uh, can be used by multiple people in the course of a day. Uh, I'll just read the titles of them. First of all, there's a charm of glibness. There is a rabbit's foot. There's a bottle of oryx balm. That oryx is a kind of ox. Uh, and a bottle of cloud candies and three bottled deep breaths. Uh, so I'll read out the descriptions of them, which would also be included in the, uh, in the, 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 the handwritten cards. All the handwritten cards are in the same, uh, same handwriting, which leads you to suspect that probably it's the, essentially the, the publicist for the circus themselves, which is uh, producing uh, the sort of gift basket um, of prizes. The cloud candies sounds like something that would be popular at music festivals. Well, uh, possibly. So I'll, <laughs> I'll run through some of these. Um, I've already talked about the Pearl of Wonders Power. Okay, those ones aren't there. Um, if you are in Roll20, these will be under um, the uh, Journal tab. I've rearranged things a little bit better, hopefully. Under Magic Items, you'll find Wonders Items, Consumables, Charms, Weapons, so forth. 
Um, first of these is Oryx Bomb. I'm just reading them in the order they happen to be in Roll20. This wide jar is sealed with leaves and bound in leather, leather straps. Even then, it's hard not to smell a whiff of the horrid, greasy gel inside. The terrible smelling gel, when rubbed on tired muscles or swiped beneath the nose, can restore a person and to keep going when the work isn't done. By applying or inhaling a dose of this bomb, you restore one level of exhaustion. It can only be applied effectively once per day. It has a burning sensation when it touches the skin or the lungs, which lingers on for a few minutes, and it also has a tremendous smell, which lingers for about an hour. During that time, creatures which can sense you with smell have advantage to do so. Um, by using three, It's not flammable, is it? it uh, yeah, everything is flammable with enough heat. Uh, <laughs> by using three doses of this bomb, it is said to be able to cure the paralyzed or petrified conditions. Um, so if you use it up in more, uh, there are 10 doses in one jar. So it can be used for, for direct things, or if you have very serious conditions, it's one of the few things that can, uh, uh, solve that. Cloud candies. This clear bottle seems to weigh almost nothing, despite being filled with little fluffy can uh, candies. Upon one eating one of these very airy, sticky, marshmallow-like candies, a person finds himself lifting off the ground like a lazy balloon. The spell Levitate is cast upon the consumer using no components, with the duration, though, of only one minute, as opposed to the normal ten. No one is in control of the spell, although the consumer may move as though climbing. So if you're familiar with Levitate, uh, the spell, you immediately shoot up 20 feet in the air, and you float there. Um... You're not in control of it, but it, you can consider it to be essentially like you're in zero G. Um, so moving up and down doesn't cost any additional movement. Climbing is basically if you can ca ca uh, catch on to something, you can uh, can maneuver your way up. And I would allow you to try to swim. That would be basically difficult terrain uh, to try to swim through the air. Once it wears off, or, like, I mean, do we like, gently it... drop down to the floor? Or do we you do crash not. Down to the floor? <laughs> you fall from whatever height you have to be at. I mean, it could be useful if you're at, like, the bottom of the water and need to quickly get back to the top. That would be one <laughs> great use of it. Uh, and I, I think there's all kinds of creative ways, ways this can be used, either as a benefit for yourself or slipping a cloud candy into someone else's uh, food. Uh, might be hilarious until they crash down from 20 feet. The Bottled Deep Breaths. Each captured gas is contained in a small leaded gas uh, glass file, Stoppered with a thick, waxed-over cork, inside seems entirely clear. These extremely potent aromatics, said to be a brew consisting of bile from a deep-water creature, garlic, and some sort of caustic mineral, are capable of arousing a person from the deepest <clears throat> of slumbers. You can unstopper the vial and wave it where someone can breathe it in, a single target, or you can throw the bottle to shatter it, and all creatures within a five-foot radius are affected. The smelling salts have this, the following effect. The target, or targets, will wake instantly from a normal or magically induced sleep. This will not work uh, on a cursed sleep or an item which has constant effects, so it's not a remove curse in that sense. The target will be remo can remove the unconscious or stunned conditions. If the target is paralyzed, frightened, or incapacitated, they can immediately re-roll their saving throw with advantage. Following exposure, any targets must immediately also make a constitution saving throw against DC-12 or be at disadvantage to all actions for one minute as they are coughing and gagging. So those are distributed in individual small bottles. Uh, I believe, i got to check my list here, but I believe it is uh, uh, three bottles of the deep breaths. The bottle of cloud candy contains eight candies and the Oryx Bomb is ten doses. Um, and it's a kind of a greasy, if you've ever used Tiger Bomb, that's basically the Oryx version of that. Um, let's see what comes next. Uh, the Charm of Glibness. Uh, reminder, you do some, somewhere have a Charm of Courage as well. Uh, charms tend to be small effects uh, that uh, do not require uh, attunement. That is indeed the case in the Charm of Glibness, a small wooden charm in the shape of a smiling mouth with a tongue sticking out. The item has three charges, which reset at sunset, so a little bit different from most. Basically, when the party starts, so does the item. Uh, if not already worn, does take an action to put on yourself or another. That's the same as the Charm of Courage you already have. 
Uh, it has the effect glibness. One charge takes a bonus action. The wearer of this charm may grip the charm, expend a charge, and use a bonus action to let it inspire their words. The charm grants a plus two bonus on the next immediate persuasion, intimidation, or performance check. So it can be very useful if you find yourself needing to find just the right words. And there's one of those. It does have three charges, though, and another person can wear it. It doesn't require attunement. It's really just the, the wearer that gets the bonus. And finally, a rabbit's foot. The fuzzy, preserved, severed foot of a white hare. Let's hope you have better luck than it did. Just try not to be greedy. It has the effect lucky. One charge can be used as a reaction. The bear may rub the fuzzy end of the charm to release the good luck blessing from it. The charm releases a single point of luck, which can be used immediately or any time before the wearer sleeps, so a long rest. This point of luck may be used to either re-roll, with advantage, any failed roll the bearer may have made, uh, and any ones are also automatically re-rolled again. So if you re-roll and you get ones, those are actually re-rolled. Uh, it's a little bit better than the typical luck points. Uh, it may also be used to force anyone else to re-roll a successful roll with disadvantage, and any 20s are automatically re-rolled on that second roll. Um, it only has three charges, uh, and the uh, charges do not re uh, return, so it does not re uh, recharge. Again, all of those are in uh, in roll 20. Hopefully they make sense Um as with all the things that I create, there may be unintended consequences that we may need to adjust later on. Uh, but you're welcome to use those. Um, although, again, the tag for the rabbit's foot says don't be greedy, whatever that means. All right. So that business out of the way. Um, I will later on uh, indicate which of the, uh, of the vendors created each item. Um, they are still going to be in town for a couple of days, so you could purchase additional uh, elements of these if you wanted to. Um, but these were the ones that were included in the, the gift basket that uh, uh, Maximus decided to give to the overwhelming stellar performance, which produced a pretty significant door, door amount as well for them. All right. Now, that having been said, there's a lead up to the party. The performance was one night, the party is late the next night, so you have a day if you need to um, do any particular work or prepare for anything. Uh, in the case of uh, Annie, they will be delivering the dress to the Three Bells, and because they know these things, the Three Bells themselves are, are going to assist you in, uh, in getting ready. Um, they have been looking forward to this perhaps even more than you have, perhaps more than most. They themselves are not going to be at the party, but they are delighted with the idea of the party. Um, for okay. you, Medric, uh, there will be a suit delivered for you, uh, which is going to be there. Remember, this is a masquerade ball, so yeah. um, there will be a mask involved for you to wear. Um, the suit will be reinforced somewhat so that it does not light on fire uh, and not be a delicate, frilly thing with uh, perfume on it that would be rather bad to someone who tends to burn. <laughs> and of course, as I said, Silas, you have your own idea about how you want to get in. There is a band to be playing, and uh, your reputation does precede you, depending on how you want to approach that. Or if you want to try to sneak in, that's also an option for you. Um, you do have a, a contact at the castle, although... Um, uh, Sable is a little hard to get in touch because she's been busy at the castle all day. Um, which probably means she's trying to sneak away at some point. So, um, following the contentious uh, uh, meeting between Annie, Verendel, and Sable, I believe that Annie has a, um, a reaction, if you will, to that. Yep. Um, I do plan on giving Verendel like his space. However, I do find that think that he does deserve an explanation of some kind. Um, so I am going to, uh, when I get back to the three bells, I'm going to write a letter and I'll probably uh, deliver it to his uh, house when I go 
for for a quick run there. Okay, easily enough done. Um, you write up the letter. You don't have any sight of him. Maybe he's not actually there at the moment. Maybe he is and just avoiding everything for the moment. Um, but uh, the letter gets read later on that day. So I'd like to hear you read the letter to Captain Verendel. Um, It's a very stream of conscious letter. Uh, so, and I, I wrote it purposefully that way. Um, so uh, it starts, hey, I don't know how, how to, but I do feel that I owe you an explanation. Overall, everything that I told you was really the truth. I just omitted specifics. Uh, I am the eldest of a noble family from the capital, traveling before I eventually inherit my parents' land. I just never said who my parents were specifically. Uh, this and that I was Gaetano's apprentice were the only lies that I ever told you. Um, I was actually Sir Conrovo's apprentice. Uh, and honestly, I'm more scared of her reaction than my parents would ever tell. Uh, originally, I had asked my parents if I could travel to learn about the islands firsthand. Uh, my my uh, proposition uh, was to have one of the six uh, come with me, as well as my guard, uh, to travel uh, as a small group from city to city for, for a few months. Uh, I wanted to take the opportunity to meet my people and make connections, uh, not because of what I am and what represent, but for who I am. The uh, they decided that it was too risky, so I left on my own. Uh, I've wanted to tell you, but never really knew how. Uh, to even start. Medric and Silas know because of Gaetan, the, the Gaetano situation. Uh, like I mentioned, who would have the guts to straight up out a member of the six who was traveling un undercover and survive that? Uh, I did need an, uh, uh, an explanation and he pushed me, me to tell them. Uh, at the time, he was still uh, considering to drag me back to the capital and I completely expected him to do so. Uh, and I'm still confused as to why he didn't. However, uh, while I had been doing uh, uh, while I had been doing work with them, I had just met you a couple of times at that point. Why would I trust you to not contact someone in the capital to come and get me? And now that I've gotten to know you and trust you, how do I find the right time or way to say, hey, I know I have always been really vague about my background and stuff, but here's why, please don't. Uh, don't do what really is your job and what I cover. Uh, while I'm not necessarily actual running away from home, uh, and I'm, I'm in no hurry to return after a few weeks on land, uh, I have since sent them a letter to tell them where I am, uh, as I do understand that I was naive to, to leave on my own. And, uh, sorry, as I kind of have been in a few dangerous situations, but I have also explained that there are things going on here that I still intend to figure out before I leave. Uh, as for letting S return on her own, uh, from my experience, getting caught sneaking out and uh, with what is happening with her parents, I truly believe that it's the safest option for her. While I do not agree with who she has gotten to help her, the reason that she, she snuck out is because she is worried about what's going, happening with her parents uh, as well and is looking for someone to help. The only reason that she found out who I who I am is about the rumor is I asked about the rumor uh, of a royal family member who, who will be at the party and the shit I look too much like my mother for them to realize uh, sank in when she told me uh, a couple of days ago. I honestly and honestly, who am I to blow her cover? She has a much better reason to sneak out than than I did. I, I really am sorry for not being completely upfront with you. Uh, I do hope that you can continue to see me as Annie, that random girl that showed up and seems to not be able to stay out of trouble. But I understand if you can't. Uh, the reality of being me is that everyone treats me uh, for my title uh, to an extent, even my parents and sister. So I'm used to that. Uh, it was really nice to be able to just be Annie for a little bit. Uh, it is lonely, but I understand why it happens. Uh, I would be honored if you could still accept uh, accompanying me to the party. Um, we, uh, we can part ways afterwards if that's what, what you wish. Either way, uh, I've been working on this for, for the past couple of weeks, so please accept this as a, an apology gift, if nothing else. Yours, A, 
Uh, and in the envelope, there's a handkerchief with his initials embroidered that I've been working on for a couple of days. Uh, and the envelope is sealed with my signet ring and purple wax. All right. Well delivered. And uh, I'm very bad. I hope he at, accepts the apology. I'm very bad at giving out inspiration, but I definitely want to acknowledge that with inspiration. Yay. Uh, and I will try to be better at uh, about that as well. So um, perhaps at some point you end up walking in that direction at some point during later on the day and you do see that the letter is or has been received. Uh, what the response is, you're still not certain. Um, how about we talk to Medric? So while the 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 uh, the gown, the 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 clothing was delivered to you, um, what does it look like? I want you to have the creative opportunity if you want to describe what it looks like. Given that there is um, this is Melora's doing, so mm -hmm. um, flavor it however you think that Melora might consider Medric. Uh, and also Medric does have a reputation as the Phoenix champion, so that can be uh, fed into what was created for him. Did you, like, uh, give us a hint in the past as to how she views Medric? Um, like I said, more like, like a love type of thing or like fangirl type of thing? Um, I think that, well, I'll have you make an insight roll for how Medric sees it. Um, but from the player's perspective, um, Melora respects uh, Medric mm -hmm. and sees him as a worthy partner. You're not sure if there's anything necessarily deeper romantic to that. Um, okay. But Medric would have the same impression is that she's attracted to him. And, you know, the, all of the old analogies, things that, that the different ways that, that would have been phrased when you were training with the Ignians come to mind, like a moth attracted to the flame. Uh, right. You know, so so some, of, some of your thinking is probably reflecting some of the training you've been given over time and seeing it in entirely different ways. Um, you know, moth attracted the flame, you know, was often probably talked about how evil will come after the bright flame, but it also is how, burned. how it can be, uh, you know, you will attract followers as you progress and those followers will see you as something worthy of getting close to, but it may be their danger if they do so. Well, Laura though is a strong person. You've, you've known that ever since first meeting her on the caravan that was attacked on the road. Um, and she's takes after her father, uh, Ardwin, who you also know to be a shrewd businessman. Um, and you sensed a bit of tension between the two of them, as in, uh, Melora wants her independence, which is probably why mm -hmm. she actually rides the caravans rather than rides a desk. But she does respect her father. So take all that together and see what, uh, what creatively inspires you. Okay. So I'm assuming she would like to make Medric look like a badass with this outfit. So the mask is going to be, uh, it's, it's going to have like, fuck, I wish I could draw, I'll draw it out after the session's over, but uh, there's going to be uh, whatever the equivalent to Skorovsky crystals are in Omasia. So there's going to be some of those like decorating um, the mask and it's going to be like two wings kind of on the side, but pointing towards the back. Okay. And two like second wings above them. It makes sense in my mind. I'll, I'll draw it out. I think that the in this area, getting a hold mm -hmm. of, of crystals or even semi-precious ones might be difficult. But okay. um, as a possible Shiny substitute... Paint, then. Well, as a possible substitute, um, shells. There are all kinds okay. of opalescent shells in the area. And when broken into small pieces in place, they could, they could give you that same effect. Okay. Or like, yeah, shells painted shiny red and orange and yellow. Okay. And for the... Suit. Uh, the back would be long. The short of the top would be front, or the short of the front. Fuck sakes. Words. Like I have a picture in my mind, but I just can't describe it. It's okay. Take your time. Because words. Okay. So the top part has a. Well, it's not like a conventional suit. And <laughs> I wish I could just like project my mind into the screen. I, like <laughs> I'm, I'm right there with you because the, whenever I try to draw anything, it does not come out as what was in my head. Um, 
but take your time. If you need a few minutes to think about it or to think the words, uh, then then I can give you that if you want. All right, let's okay. do that. Okay. Um, we'll move into uh, Silas's domain for a moment. Um, what is Silas's general plan um, to get into the party, and what approach does he want to take? Um, I have a thought on that. Uh, but first, I just wanted to ask: Did Dudek ever sign Silas's book? Um, I just wanted to get that out of the way. If it did, what was what was Silas's explanation as to why? So that we could talk with him. And that was it. There I was think he nothing, did, yeah. There was nothing deeper than that? No, there's nothing else that it does. It's just uh, he can cast sending. Okay. Uh, That's to contact him. mechanical, but what was the semantic mm-hmm. uh, pitch? So to, we can keep get. in touch with him. Okay. Because we have no other way to contact him. Okay. He would sign the book. He's actually okay. really curious about okay. it and would try to examine the book, but probably can't really see much of it because it's made of shadows that only you can read properly. Um, yeah, and I mean, he would test it out on the show. Here's how it works and that sort of thing. Intriguing. And the same thing he did with the others. It's like, you can erase the name. It's not a permanent thing. Um, now for the party. Um, okay. Uh, Silas is just going to wear his normal adventuring gear. It's fairly close fitting. Uh, he can make images of things over it. Um, he's uh, the the ring of spell storing. He's going to charge with a dimension door and a hex spell because after dimension door, he's only got one slot left. Um, and he will. Unless someone particularly wants to take something, or one of those prizes we got with them, he's just going to keep those in a bag uh, so that we've got them at the party if we need them. Uh, and unless someone else feels they need it, he'd wear the charm of glibness for the party as well because he may need to lie his way into or out of something. Um, and yeah, his plan is to uh, basically just get close enough to the castle that he can see one of the upper floors that doesn't have any lights on. Uh, He's going to cast uh, Pass Without Trace from the staff and then Dimension Door up to the balcony and then work through the castle from there. Okay. That's why he's not wearing anything particularly disguisey. Uh, he's just going to be using disguise self as he goes. Or anything masquerade I meant. Okay, just making a note here. So we're splitting the party. <laughs> yep. Um, with the names, Nothing wrong with, that. with the names in your book, is that effectively sending? Yeah, it just lets him cast the sending spell any number of times, but only to those people. Okay, so you can still be in touch with them even though you're separated at the party. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's one of the reasons why I changed his dark sight to this because it's more generally useful. Okay. Um, you do know that Dudek is also going to be at the party. In fact, he's looking forward to it uh, and has a couple of of uh, ideas about what he's going to be wearing. Um, ancient masks he's found on the different travels that he's gone through. Um, cool. Uh, Silas does not let him know that Silas is going to be at the party. That's a secret that only the three of us know. Yep. I just figured that while you went to him to get your book signed, he would have, he would have let that slip um, yep. as an opportunity. Cool. Uh, and he was invited. Um, he was invited indirectly. Basically, Maximus was given a certain number of tickets he could he could give to his people, and Dudek was one of those people. All right. And okay. Uh, how's it going, uh, uh, Medric? Do you feel you want to? Be, are you able to describe the the outfit now? 
Uh, I was drawing it out. <laughs> That's fine. I appreciate that. Okay. You can give us the broad strokes now, and we can you can always refine it later. Okay, well, the mask looks something like this. I don't know if you guys can see that. Cool. I haven't done the colors because I don't have any colored pencils. <laughs> I'm and... sorry, I haven't had time to color it yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the outfit is like fuck six <laughs> no yep you almost yep. had it there lag right it's like short in the front longer in the back picture kind of like, something kind of like loki's coach except in red and yellow and orange okay. <laughs> kind of almost like a tux and tails kind of thing yeah it's like it drags almost to the floor but it doesn't touch the floor because that's just not convenient and the floor is dirty and uh, the sleeves are fitted at the top but looser at the bottom and there's uh, large cuffs that are like turned back with bling around them and like a pair of like secondary cuffs kind of like fuck. I'm really bad at explaining things so I just draw them out no that's fine there's one sleeve and there's like little fuck no other way no you're there you're there and there's like just needs more to shells stuck on the sleeve okay that go up the shoulder Cool. And there'd be like accents on the shoulders too to look like kind of like Phoenix wings, but I haven't had the chance to draw those yet. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, I just have to make a note. Uh, is there anything that Annie or Medrick wants Silas to bring with him? Uh, since like they're in masquerade and probably can't bring all of the things they might want to. I always have a dagger concealed on me, like in the sleeve on on, on my leg, so I'm good. Uh, um, <laughs> is there a way I can like camouflage a hammer in this outfit? <laughs> I don't think Melora would have thought of that. <laughs> uh, probably. I think she thought specifically to prevent that because you were saying you were going to go in arm. All oh, right, right. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did say that, didn't I? Uh, well, for the, the illustration and, and even stuff that's to come and for the description, uh, please take inspiration for that. Again, trying to be a little bit more proactive in that. And for making a plan to sneak in, I will give you inspiration as well, Silas. Whether or not the plan is successful. Yeah, I don't think Silas actually used the, the point that he had last time, so okay. I'm still good. Um, like many things, like the consumables that I've just given you and like uh, inspiration, I want you to feel free to use those and I will try to replenish all of those things, not necessarily with the same things over and over again, but with other replenishables. But I will be waiting until you have diminished your supply before giving it so you don't end up with this stockpile of, well, we've got 50 vials of this and 200 vials of these other things. And man, we've got a whole closet full of these other, you know, furs and stuff. Wait, do I actually... Did I actually get inspiration? An inspiration point for my horrible description? Yeah. Oh wow. Yep. Okay. Cool. <laughs> that and for the illustration and and uh, for uh, for giving it a moment. I'll try to actually finish it. All right. So this is the last day of the of the festivities, correct? Yes. Um, like I said, they're they're packing up already, but they aren't going to be leaving for a couple of days. So they are doing some things like. Hey, if we can just sell out of these things, we don't have to actually carry them anywhere. Uh, that sort of thing. Not very much. Because I sales, do but... have, yeah, I do have like uh, a dozen prize tokens <laughs> that I need to claim. Um, so basically, she's going to either look for anything that might be that she would might find useful, or trinkets. Okay. He, either a very useful thing or a trinket. <laughs> well, um, why don't you describe to me what a very useful thing would be? I mean, I'm going to guess that most places aren't going to be like having like weapons and shit as a prize. So I'm thinking like, I don't know if, if any place has like any potions or any uh anything that can be used for disguises or stuff like that okay um there is a fearbolg who was uh, 
pushing a cart around named Booba. She's actually the one that makes the candies as well. But she does make uh, potions of a number of kinds. Let's see what we got here. For example, uh, where did you go? Scrolling it away from me. Here we go. Um, she does have potions that uh, uh, sort of increasingly larger bottles uh, with the silhouettes hand drawn of. Uh, increasingly larger giants on the fronts of the bottles. Uh, and she does say that these are these are, are bottled essences of massive humanoid creatures. This one, a frost giant. This one, a hill giant. And this one, a giant of stone. And this last one, the biggest of all, a fire giant. The essence of them is boiled down. It's a very long process and takes many, many weeks to acquire the necessary bits and pieces. And it's not easy. The giants are very um, protective of their bits and pieces. But essentially, these are po potions of giant strength. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, frost giant strength and the hill giant strength are both five tickets worth. The stone giant strength is seven tickets worth, and the fire giant strength is ten tickets worth. They're each one use. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. I'll get the... What's the difference between the, the potions mechanically? Um, basically, the amount of strength you will get... Um, the frost giant is, let's see, um, hmm, okay, I didn't vet some of these, so they need to be updated. Uh, there will be side effects, depending on which one, because I, I feel like if you make something out of frost or make something out of fire, it would also make a difference. So uh, mm -hmm. the frost giant strength is 23, the hill giant strength is 21. The, uh, I'll have to check these again. Stone giant strength is 23, and fire giant strength is 25. Um, in addition, mm -hmm. um, there is resistance for some of these. So the uh, hill giant strength, I'm going to add this in myself just now so I remember, um, would have resistance um, to bludgeoning. bludgeoning damage okay. the um, stone or sorry the uh, stone giant strength would give you an AC bonus so AC plus two in addition to the strength uh, okay. fire giant strength gives you resistance to fire and the frost giant uh, strength gives you resistance to cold okay um, well, I have 12 tokens, so I'll get the stone and let's do stone and hill giant. Okay. So yeah, the stone, the hill giant one, uh, resistance to bludgeoning. The stone giant one gives you AC plus two and they all last for an hour. They have no effect if your strength is already higher than that, but, you know. Actually, they still have the resistances, even if they do have the strength higher than that, but I don't think anybody has a higher than 21 strength at the moment. I mean, my strength Not is me. 12, so. <laughs> uh, and there will be some visible effect while you're using these as well. It won't just be an internal strengthening of muscles. You will grow muscles. You will look buff and giant. Uh, even well, it's a good way to escape being noticed. Um, yeah. Actually, I mean, I'm, remi family. <laughs> I'm reminded of the of the hex given to Harry from Hermione, uh, which essentially was the bee sting hex, where his face swelled up so he wouldn't be recognized. <laughs> so you get all swole, and swole Andy can't be recognized. <laughs> all right. So, uh, I 
for um, for Medrick. Yep. Uh, Melora shows up later on that evening, and they have. Uh, she has the the best wagon that the Cartwrights have. Most of their wagons are very functional, um, mm-hmm. so this one is basically one of the functional wagons. But there has been some effort to try to dress it up a little bit. It's been painted. Uh, it's been painted red and silver and gold. Uh, in sort of a, a pattern that matches similar to the outfit that you were given. So it would be as if you are riding in a, uh, in a fury wagon. Nice. Um, she has uh, someone else who is uh, acting as the, um, I don't know if I have them right here, but there was a, another, uh, another woman who was, uh, I think a half elf, who was in the caravan. She's actually serving as the driver for this evening. And she's wearing decent clothes, nothing particularly fancy, nothing comparatively. Uh, and you see Melora sitting in the back, standing uh, back straight, uh, ready to go. She's not wearing her mask. She's carrying it beside her. But you can see the mask has this um, large bark-like pattern on the outside and what looks like uh, branches that, that, uh, that flow off of the, the sides of this mask. Her body... Uh, is covered in fabric that looks like it's made from small uh, leaf-like patterns. Uh, Gold and uh, red and green fall-like patterns of these leaves, almost as though she herself has fallen out of of the trees uh, and alighted down on the the surface. Uh, And she welcomes you to to join her. Um, Her her manner, while usually uh, a little gruff and forward, is a little bit more deferential. But mostly because she sees you wearing the outfit properly uh, and and seems to be pleased with the impression that you're going to make when you get there. Nice. Um, so kind of representing a little bit of the golden and fall. Um, hey, Melora, thanks again for the invitation. I like how the uh, seashells look like jewels with the paint. Good. You are worthy of fine clothes and fine things. Thanks. I just hope I don't ruin them, <laughs> which is normally the reason why I don't wear fine clothing, but I, I'll do my, I, I, nothing bad's going to happen tonight. That depends. Can and the player dance? knocks on wood. Can you uh, dance? Well, I've practiced hand-to-hand combat and footwork is involved in that, so uh, I can probably dance. Perhaps we'll take a slight detour then. And so she instructs the driver to to drive, not directly to the barony, but in fact over to one of Cartwright's many uh, warehouses, uh, one that happens to be empty because they're awaiting a shipment. Uh, and okay. there she proceeds to try to instruct you on dancing. It doesn't okay. entirely feel natural to her either, and there is this temptation she has to lead constantly in the dance, but then is trying to reach a, a sort of a mutual accord. It never gets to the point where she lets you lead. It's more like both of you lead. And she's trying to <laughs> trying to find a balance between the two of you. Um, please make a an appropriate dancing I'm learning role, please. Do I have anything here that can help me? Uh-huh. Athletics? I'll accept athletics. Because, I mean, you need cardio to dance. Well, I'm, okay, well, I'm assuming we're not, like, doing breakbeats. It's, it's, <laughs> I mean, if you want to break out the breakbeats, it's it's going to be interesting. Yeah, let's go with athletics. All right. I'm going to see if I can find Melora's friends. 13. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a bit rough. Um you kind of you find yourself kind of getting into it a little bit. Well, actually, I won't I won't describe your mood of it. Um, you can describe that. How how is uh, Medric reacting to this to this uh, uh, complicated suddenly kind of awkward, skill? focusing too much on my body movements, and it's like shit. I don't I don't want to be awkward. I don't want to step on her foot accidentally because I'm pretty sure I'm like gonna break a bone or something if I step on her foot. So it's kind of like this like anxiety. But trying my be- but at the same time trying my best. Okay. Because I'm assuming like during like fight training, Medrick would have had a like in hand to hand classes, like footwork as in like how to get out of the way of an incoming attack and like. Anyway, in real life, I know that martial arts footsteps can like almost translate to like dance coordination. 
because I've done both. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, Kara. It's is... like my old uh, instructor used to say, if you can dance, you can fight. <laughs> <laughs> what if I can't do either? Um, <laughs> so Kara is the driver. I do she either was, than Fireball. She, <laughs> she was the one who, uh, who was kind of in the back with the bow last mm -hmm. time. Um, both fighting, but also being a little bit afraid of the fighting. Uh, and she stifles a laugh, uh, especially at a, a, a shot look from Melora. Um, Melora explains that, yes, it can be related to fighting. And you, you get the impression that she knows how to fight, not in the same training level as you, but she can hold herself into combat. And she kind of explains that you were kind of overthrusting. <laughs> you were you were treating it like a combat, always trying to win the dance. Uh, and so she kind oh, yeah, of moderates you a little team effort, huh? <laughs> <laughs> moderates you a little bit into into shifting your focus a little bit more. Um, but um, she does note that with time, with time, you will get better. Which sounds both well, how like much a time do we have, by threat. the way? Uh, it, it's it's a while. Um, you will likely be fashionably late than the early <laughs> uh, the early curfew. Basically, it wouldn't start until seven anyway. And okay. you're probably going to be seven thirty, eight o'clock by the time you get there from this particular diversion. Um, checking in with Silas, uh, what other preparations, if any, uh, or what are things that the Silas wants to get accomplished that day since he's not having to worry about getting an outfit or, or finding someone to go with him? Um, I don't think there's much else. He's just making sure that he's got uh, everything he needs packed up and... Uh, is he staying ready in, to go? Is he staying in town, or is he going to go to the Marsh Village at all? Uh, well, he'd be starting off at home, okay. and then he'd uh, walk up to the road and uh, head up the path to the castle. Okay. Um, he'd let the others know when he's heading out, just in case. While you're at the Marsh Village. And things are proceeding as a, a relatively normal day. Um, it's another day of, of, of surviving off the sea. Um, the uh, statue work continues. Uh, it's getting refined. It's looking really, really good. Um, this kid is getting more and more dedicated. Um, almost a little, little concerning the level of dedication that the, uh, the young, uh, I think it's Dougal, uh, is paying towards yeah. the, the construction of this. But it is taking shape, and it is starting to resemble the images of the, the mother that have come to life before you before, uh, in, in other places uh, with remarkable detail. Some details that you even forgot yourself. Um, things like the fact that uh, her, her hair in the back flows down into large snake-like bundles, which are held together. Uh, and even seem to have a little bit of motion on their own, which is accomplished even though it's made mostly out of wood, it still seems to have a certain level of, 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 uh, of flow to it. It's, it's hard to describe or hard to know, but you can feel the sense mm -hmm. of the mother behind it. Um, I congratulate him on the excellent work. All right. Keep at it. I the mother will be pleased away. by my creation. Thank you for the blessing. Um, the other thing you notice, um, which might surprise you, um, it first comes to your attention when uh, Athanos uh, steps, sort of almost, uh, uh, almost angrily walks out of uh, Odega's hut. And you can see him strangely dressed in what looks like sort of flowing robes that are uh, lined with various bits and pieces of shell that catch the light. The robes themselves are of a sort of dark uh, blue um, with uh, uh, different elements of, of uh, fishnets and different elements of, of, of uh, almost buoys, although not the actual large size, it's just sort of representative mm. uh, on it. And you can you can see him turn back to the uh, to the room, uh, or to uh, Odiga's uh, hut, where you can see Odiga kind of standing in the doorway, and he's sort of fuming and pointing at her. I will not wear this stupid thing. It's not worthy of my stature, and it's not something I'm going to wear. 
and Oda just Oda just crosses her arms and just looks at him with that that arching look, which for some of the younger folks and even yourself, perhaps when you were younger, uh, is almost withering. It's that look of control that that the that the uh, the old who know their position and know their place and know their power have. Uh, and she fixes him with that withering look. You will wear it, and not only will you wear it, you'll smile too. Oh snap! And he just <laughs> he stalks off for a while. Odega sees you uh, seeing this and just sort of gives you a curt nod. Um, Silas, it's a uh, preparations for celebration. We have been invited, recognized by the barony. And it is of our best interest to make a good impression. A strong one. Silas just in his head thinks, oh, sweet fuck. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> uh, mother, why did you allow this? Uh, okay. Well. Good luck. Thank you. Your blessing is accepted. Silas so walks off thinking, why do they keep saying that? <laughs> uh, you can make an insight check, actually, as well from that. Oh, I'm pretty sure why they're saying that. Just Silas is a little dim. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, other than that, he'd... Uh, yeah, he'd just be... Uh, I guess packing things up so that he can have easy access to them. Um, let's see if he can get like a belt or something that has pouches on it. Uh, how, I mean, getting a basic belt isn't so hard. What sort of pouches are you looking at? Utility belt. Oh. <laughs> I'm thinking Batman. Uh, something that'll give him like reasonably quick access to small items um at the moment probably the best you could do would be a, a pouch belt um with small yeah. pouches attached to it tied on with yeah with the i guess a couple of like money belts or something and uh, that's where he'll store the candies and the other small items okay yeah they're in they're in relatively secure and and uh relatively easy to get to other than that, yeah, he just, uh, I guess, just does normal village stuff until like a couple hours before we're supposed to head up for things. Um, he will offer to walk Odega and Ethnos uh, up towards the castle. He's not going to tell them that he's going in, though. At a certain point, Athanos has come fuming back, um, kind of having sort of settled himself a little bit and resolved himself to the situation, still not happy about it. Uh, old grumpy fisherman is the impression I want you to get from Athanos at the moment. Uh, at mm -hmm. that point, Odiga welcomes him back, and she has partially completed her outfit. Uh, which looks as though it is sort of silver blue um, long ribbons essentially that uh, are are attached around her body in this sort of undulating shape that seems to twist as she moves. Uh, not entirely unlike a uh, a snake's own body. There are shells put in different places along it as well that give that sort of patterned effect to her body. And you can see that she has created masks, probably created both of the masks for each of them. Um, for herself, her mask is um, a uh, uh, a large um, a large solid hood, and then the face of a uh, of a snake. Pretty on the on the nose for her. Athenos's outfit is a little bit odd, um, and as he, she starts to add more things onto it it starts to take shape, which is to say that it has almost no shape whatsoever. And for him, it appears almost as though he's clad in uh, seaweed and jetsam and flotsam caught in a net. And then the very top of the mask is this 
this sort of hideous thing which looks like uh, uh, seaweed branches that are, are moving outward um, with uh, large bulbous eyes that are seen recessed into the, uh, into the, the uh, fronds. Uh, it, it looks pretty hideous, actually. Uh, <laughs> although Odiga seems, to be, Odiga seems to be pretty proud of it. And Athenos has stopped complaining, but you can, just, you can practically hear him fuming. Um. um Silas will make a couple of suggestions that he thinks maybe will still stick with what Odiga wants, but allow Athenos a little more of himself there. Okay. Uh, or at least looking a little more, um, not exactly orderly, but formal-ish. Uh, uh, trying to make it look less goofy. It, it, in, the, in the dim light inside the cabin, it doesn't look goofy so much as sinister, but you realize that mm. any time the light from a window crosses it, it, it can very easily look a lot more silly. And in probably the well-lit mansion, that's probably a pretty good, uh, uh, a good uh, definition as well. Hmm. So, any so I was going to six plus whatever would add to it. So his suggestions are probably not all that great. Um, I mean, performance would possibly be it. Or um, if you have any other skill to be appropriate. I mean, uh, I, I, I've for, used disguise kit for my makeup and stuff. So. Yeah, it's true. Uh, performance would make it a 17. Wow. <laughs> so it goes from a mediocre suggestion to this is how you do flair. All right. Mm -hmm. So any any, does. any idea what the uh, what that actually would look like? How would it be described differently? Um, hmm. I think probably um, to some degree coloration, trying to add a little more of the dark shadows into it uh, as like basically painted on. Uh, so that even under the light, he's looking like he's a shadowed creature. Um, then instead of the boys, maybe just net bobbers, uh, like the little wooden bits they have on nets to hold them up. Um, uh, and probably just in arrangement. It's like, oh, talking a little bit here, move this over there. Maybe that would help. Um, and I mean, it does whatever it does. He's not super uh, worried about it, but uh, he's just seeing a point here where eh, maybe he can help them out a little bit, ease tensions a little. Okay. Um, do you have any adjustments you want to try to make to Odiga's own outfit, or are you going to leave her alone? No, I think, I mean, her her concept seems to be fine. Okay. He gets the, the flowing, watery uh, sort of thing. Um, with each of the suggestions you make towards Athenos's outfit, Odiga responds, um, kind of slightly modifying every single one of them, even when the modifications don't really change anything. Um, you get the impression that she wants to have that uh, engagement with it. Um, for, mm -hmm. for Athenos himself, though, as each of the modifications change the outfit and change the shape of it a little bit more, uh, and as you describe it, um, you catch a flash of look from Athenos, and there's this look of... Oh, thank the mother. This is going to be so much better. Uh, and you can see him, his, his stance kind of change from stooped over a bit to his shoulders pulling back with a little bit more pride. And you feel like, you feel like he's kind of warming We're up. We're going to be the laughing stock to, okay, this might be okay. It's like, yeah, I can make this work <laughs> kind of thing uh, as he straightens up. Yeah. Uh, Silas would say, excellent. And then he'll lock in. <laughs> Uh, and they will take you up on that offer to walk up to the, um, uh, well, they were going to take a wagon actually to get up there because it's quite a long walk. On, on the, on okay. The, especially so, I mean, outfits. yeah. Um, He'll join them then. But uh, Odega will suggest that you can drive the wagon. Hmm. Let me see. <laughs> it's not a difficult thing and it's presumably something you've actually done before. Given I think you've actually driven a wagon before. Um, 
I thought you guys had oh, a wagon. He does not have land vehicles didn't, at all. Didn't you rent a wagon at one point? Yeah, we, we had, had a horses. wagon at one point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were going real slow. Yeah, yeah. Medrick has uh, land vehicles, so we yeah, were, we were probably going. That was probably him. Then. Uh, and, I got a problem the other. Uh, I keep designing this outfit, and it's like, fuck, now I want to make it. So I'm going to go buy a bunch of fabric from Fabric Girl, and it's just going to sit there as I never make it. Well, I, I owe uh, myself. Maybe I'll rein back that inspiration. And <laughs> oh, that's Become looking... uninspired. That's right. That looks good. That really nice. does look good. Mm. Uh, if, if the three of you want to cosplay as these particular versions of your characters, uh, although... Silas gets it easy because it just has to be Silas. Although, if you want to cosplay, I've cosplayed Athenas, my characters before. Yeah, I know. I'd I need know. like a, a foot tall stilts, but I can probably do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want Pat to to role play or to uh, cosplay as as uh, Athenos right now, <laughs> just to see how ridiculous this could get. Uh, but uh, wonderful work! I, I'm actually kind of impressed on that. Uh, now. Uh, uh, Marie, you had described Annie's outfit that was being commissioned for her. It does arrive earlier in the day. It is complete. The tailor is with the outfit, though, because she wants to make sure that everything fits as proper. And the three bells are all kind of hovering around you uh, as they, they take you into one of the rooms upstairs, which is unoccupied. It must be the largest room. This is the room that was repaired, where uh, a large boulder had come through the wall at one point. But it's, you're muted at the moment, sorry. It's been fixed. It's been fixed. Oh, yeah. It got better. I think it was Lawrence actually that fixed it. The the guy who's working on the on the temple. Um, yeah. But they are hovering a, a, around you, and to a certain degree, while there's no bluebirds involved, uh, I do want you to have the feeling, in some sense, of 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 uh, I believe it was Cinderella going to the ball, uh, as they're kind <laughs> yep. of hovering around you and and producing this outfit. But uh, do you have a description for what this outfit looks like? Um. So it's a ball gown. Um, it has like, I also did a tiny, t a tiny drawing. <laughs> so it has like ruching. So it's cool. like, it's all pulled here and some like, white roses here. And then the mask, it's like half of it is like a butterfly wing. Uh, and I've done my makeup so that there's like little ruches on my face. And I rolled a 26 for my makeup. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, fuck. Medrick has no makeup. Makeup on point. Um, <laughs> The, the hair and makeup is on point. I'm good at that. Medrick might need to get certain specific kinds of makeup because some of it's going to boil away <laughs> if he's trying to put stuff on his skin. No problem. I'll just reach inside like the fire pit around the Everflame and just grab some ash and <laughs> do the whole like, eyeliner looks, thing. <laughs> it looks like war paint. <laughs> Goth Medrick. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it's like a butterfly wing with like swirls. Uh, and so it has a butterfly wing on one side, the flowers on, are on the other, and all of her hair, she has it pinned to the other side uh, with cascading curls. Okay. I'm just kind of writing some of this down. Some of those terms went over my head. I'm, I'm not familiar with dress terms in the, uh, in the regular, but... Uh... Very cool. I really hate myself, so I'm going to add a chiffon cape to this outfit. <laughs> a chiffon cape. <laughs> Isn't chiffon a kind of cake? Anyway. Um, okay. Um, I will add a chiffon cake. No, chiffon cape. to the. Uh, and it's like kind of like a double cape, but it's like linked together with like little chains at the back. Wow. So it looks really cool, but it's going to be a bitch to make if I ever make it, which I probably won't <laughs> because chiffon, and I hate chiffon so much. It looks cool, but I hate it. So the the uh, the outfit for Annie is, it fits like a glove because you literally have the tailor, the seamstress there, who is, who is making sure that it fits perfectly. And you get the impression, although, you know, you didn't order this specifically. You did order the, the details. But it was Verendel who had footed the bill for this, mm -hmm. thinking that you were um, still somewhat of a peasant and not necessarily of the of the price. But this is a very expensive dress. This yes. is not quite of the same quality you would get at court um, that you would have had and you were growing up with. But this is remarkably good. Um, 
and you're you're ready in, in plenty of time, um, even with all the last minute fusses and and uh, and uh, um, work that's being done, kind of to you know little nudge here, little nudge there. Um, what is so the mask is a, is a butterfly wing, right? Yes. Yeah, so it's it's a butterfly wing with like I, I sent a picture in in our Google Hangout for for like an idea, and the dress itself I didn't say colors. It's like uh, a purple with probably gold a few gold detailing and, and the white roses. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it's like a butterfly wing and then some like just swirls on the other side. The, uh, um, let's just check here. Yeah. Wrong button. Um, yeah, there, there's considerable, uh, 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 there's some considerable sort of, of delighted uh, uh, noises coming from the three bells as well. And they're praising the, the seamstress and you get the impression that, that uh, uh, the seamstress is, is almost looking exhausted. Uh, you wonder if the seamstress has slept in the last couple of days working on this particular <laughs> one. There's a tremendous amount of passion going into it, partially because, uh, and she would explain, this is, this is nothing like what I normally get to do. This is this is beautiful. This is art. This is what I've always dreamed of. I love it. Thank you. She you was so up much. at four in the morning the night before the con. I can tell. <laughs> yes, kind of. <laughs> um, and and I'm like reciprocating that that like energy of I I love it. It turned out great, and the the excitedness. Uh, the, this is my element. <laughs> <laughs> it suits you like a queen, says uh, Sandy. Oh. I'll, I'll like that. Well, thank you. <laughs> Awkward. All right, enough of this. Uh, Saffron just sort of uh, stomps out of the room. I need a drink. Uh, intended to go down. Saffron is the brewer, actually, of the family as well. So when she says she needs a drink, she's probably going directly to what she's made. Uh, either uh, actual brew or could be wine. Here's Saffron. Um, she comes <laughs> back very quickly. She's got the bottle uh, with her and some... some uh, some uh, it looks like a, a beautiful red wine um, that's been sitting for a while, very thick bottle, and she kind of runs back up with uh, uh, several glasses in one fist, but she's out of breath. I don't know if you have enough time to have much more than we tipple. Your ride is here, and, it, uh, and at that that point, she is going to pour out a little bit in each glass, kind of, uh, and there's a cheer that goes up. Um, you are muted, uh, by the way, Marie, just so you know. Yep. Um, and do you drink some uh, of it? Yep, I take a sip. It is extraordinarily sweet wine. Uh, it's probably pretty fresh as well. It's not aged very much, uh, but it is sort of candy wine, essentially. Uh, but it has a fair kick to it as well. Um, and... The three bells kind of usher you down the stairs. Uh, it does take them uh, two of the bells and behind to sort of keep the dress from getting too caught up. It's not. This is not exactly a big space, uh, and it's you know your your dress is probably bigger than this building in in in, uh, in its normal use in some ways. Uh, you know, people with with much more practical clothing are usually their guests. But at this point, you come down, and in fact, there's a, a full house in the in the downstairs. Uh, you get the impression people have been showing up for a while. Maybe some of them mm -hmm. been showing up for this. Some of them been just showing up because they're regulars, but they've been sitting there waiting because there's nobody to serve them except that dour child who's just basically sitting back in the corner, oh, God, uh, uh, kind of glaring at the wall. He's not fired all. yet. He's not fired yet. Um, but uh, he kind of looks with you. See his eyes roll both in seeing you and in kind of <laughs> seeing them. Uh, but then you also kind of notice that his eyes roll as if in uh, disappointment or, or unimpressed, but he keeps looking back at the dress, um, <laughs> kind of impressed. And you get you get a, a round of applause as you come down through as well. And probably for the first time in quite a few months, it reminds you of being at home. These people yep. appreciate you a lot more than anybody at court ever did, probably. Even though they don't know who you are, or your position, they know mm -hmm. who you are here. They see the the beautiful dress that's been created for you. This occasion feels something special. 
it's a sense of, of this party is not where everybody's going to be, but this won't be the mm-hmm. only party tonight. And, and people know why the party is happening. Yeah. And after a lot of dire things that have gone on, there's a need to kind of celebrate a bit. Um, um, before everyone was like in their fussing uh, with me, I would have made sure um, I swapped out my normal dagger in my uh, sheath to vice. Okay. Uh, and I would have made sure that like that is secure uh, underneath my petticoats. <laughs> right. Uh, it's a practical outfit after all. Exactly. You know, you can hide in here. <laughs> I've got an entire arsenal. Oh, so many drinks. <laughs> <laughs> so many things you could hide. You could hide an entire person. <laughs> <laughs> well, we may get to that. That might be an entirely different game. Um, <laughs> so how is Silas sneaking in again? <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be traveling via Petticoat Junction. Anybody remember that show from a thousand years ago? All right. Um, they kind of clear a path for you to walk through the otherwise fairly crowded room. In fact, it's it's uh, Sydney, who's the the cook, who's making a path happen. Even those who are kind of uh, you know s- uh, struck by what's happening and kind of slack jawed, she's practically shoving them out of the way uh, and making sure it happens. Uh, trust a baker to be able to push a pathway through everything. Um, and then, uh, Sandy opens up the door and, uh, kind of takes a peek out, holds the door wide and you can see outside there have not been a lot of fancy, uh, uh, wagons in this town, um, for much use. Mm -hmm. Most of them are very practical wagons meant to carry cargo here and there. What you see outside is not one of the practical wagons. Um, you are not, in fact, you probably wouldn't have noticed uh, a handsome cab in this area. Handsome cabs are two-wheeled uh, wagons. They have basically just the the uh, the area for the people inside. The person who drives it actually stands on the back of the wagon um, with uh, the the reins. Um, two extraordinary, uh, beautiful white horses, um, tall and proud. Um, normally, work horses have uh, a, a beautiful tackle that's been added onto them. Their coats have been brushed elegantly. Um, their manes are, are well tended with, uh, small bows that have been tied into them. The tackle itself looks new as if it's never been used before, or if it's been used, it's extraordinarily well kept. Um, and from out of the cab, you see the door open. It's Verendel. And Verendel steps out. He's dressed head to toe in this silver and white and gold outfit. You've seen some people at court when they get dressed up. Mm-hmm. And Verendel has definitely been to court. He looks elegant and composed. He looks uh, um, strong. His hair has been, has been uh, slicked back. Uh, his, his, uh, uh, he has a collar on, which has this sort of almost a uh, uh, mane-like effect that flows a little bit longer in the back than it does in the, in, the, in the front. And in fact, as you kind of glance back and forth, you almost see the similarity between the way the, the manes of the horses has been, have been uh, uh, fluffed up a bit and, and prepared and in his. And there are things tied into the mane as well. Little, little silver and, and opalescent uh, balls have been tied in there to kind of give it additional uh, texture and meticulously done um and he looks at you and his eyes he's he's tries to control his expression but his eyes sell sell everything as they go a slight bit wider um and he steps forward and you can see that in his left hand he's grasping a scroll of paper with a purple seal on it which he then slides into his inner pocket not sure if he's read it or not, but he has gotten it. Then he extends his hand to you. Apology accepted. And bows. Milady, you look amazing. I'm happy you came. There are a few tasks 
which I have ever wanted to do more. And he takes your hand and helps you into the cab. On the other side of the cab, opposite from where the seats are, you can see his mask. And it's long. It has a pale, a similar pale white and, and silver and opalescent look to it. The head is shaped somewhat like a horse. And on, on the very top of it, you can see what looks like, if it's not genuine, then it is an incredible recreation of a unicorn's horn. And you ride up to the castle. And you can see, as you kind of look, glance back out the window, you can see that the door of the three bells is filled with people who are all trying to get a look. They're practically <laughs> falling all over each other. In fact, as you kind of pull away, uh, one of the, the, the people kind of falls to the front. And you recognize it as that dour young boy who's kind of been caught out a little bit right now uh, as, as being as interested as everyone else. You kind of, you can see him wiping off his knees and probably saying something really angrily. Uh, and then Sandy kind of ruffles his hair and he scowls at her as the people go back inside. So, first to arrive will be Silas and crew, because they left early thinking it would take longer, and they want to make an impression. Nightfall has just sort of uh, started, uh, twilight essentially at the moment. Okay. Okay. Uh, I watch out for sparkly vampires. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Silas will leave them. Uh, he'll get up, or he'll, uh, actually, he'll drive them up. There's no reason not to. Uh, up to the front, and then uh, I guess go park the cart and uh, tell them to have a good night. So as you rise, enjoy up, yourselves. Rise up the hill. Um, to see the the mansion on the uh, on the the very top of Raven's Bluff, um, there are in fact two buildings side by each. There's the mansion itself, which is uh, uh, only a two story mansion, but it's very very large. To the left of the mansion is a long wooden structure, um, which you're you're fairly certain is actually where they house um, some of the servants, some of the the uh, Baron's guard. Uh, it also serves as a storehouse as well. Out in front of the building are two, um, uh, I never did find the term for them, but essentially they are um, uh, roofed extensions uh, that are almost like ex out outdoor hallways. And what they have is that, that people will bring their, their horses or carts there. They can be tended to by local attendants uh, and kind of left out front. Uh, they also serve as a walkway in case it's raining. You can go directly from your... Uh, from your uh, cart or your wagon underneath the, the covering and walk up to the house. And the covering kind of extends towards the stairs, keeping people dry. A few people are there already, um, not that many, uh, not that many. Uh, and so they, they kind of, there are uh, a couple of, of young uh, men and women, uh, all dressed the same. There, there is sort of the, the, the livery of the barony. Um, the they they do have a uh, small crow pendant essentially or a small crow crest, which is on their outfits. It's kind of their their official badge as, as well. Um, make a uh, hmm. Make two rolls for me as you approach the house. Make a nature roll and make a hmm. We'll call this an insight roll. Okay. Um... As you're riding up, Odega in particular is kind of tr doing her best to look regal in the situation, weirdly enough. She's kind of like the, the idea that she's got a driver out front and they're being, they're, they're being, to, they're coming to talk to the local baron and baroness. She has put on her, her mask as they approach. Uh, and Athenos just kind of reluctantly uh, waited until they get right there and got the uh, elbow into the, the uh, ribs in order to get the inspiration to put his on. Uh, 11 nature and 10 insight. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, you don't notice nothing. Well, you do notice a few things. A 10 is a basic success. It's not really all that great, so there's not huge insight going on here. Um, the For the insight role, um, you can see that there's a lot of activity going on. People are on... on uh, uh, tips and tips and toes, and you can see the people are being, 
even still now, many of the servants are still being instructed, uh, given a lot of, of uh, firm uh, instruction. Um, the one thing you do notice is beyond the tension of just the event itself, there is a sense of tension in terms of security. Um, the, the Baron's guards were loaned towards the effort to, to protect the town, uh, but then kind of retreated and let the uh, local uh, town's guards take over all of the normal activities. But they've all been brought here uh, and all been, and looks like they've been reinforced as well. You see a lot of, uh, of guards around kind of circling the area. And you're noticing a number of going into that, that extra building off to the, to the left as well, which you might reasonably work out is actually the guards' barracks. Uh, pretty large for, for, for this. Um, but then again, you're noticing that there are dozens of servants. Uh, many of them are young. Uh, it's a good way for a young man or woman to earn a couple of coins here and there. Um, but it kind of surprises you just how much there would be, especially in such a remote area. For the nature check, uh, as you're riding up the hill and noticing that the air is getting thinner and cooler as it does, which is normally from the height anyway, um, you're also noticing that the vegetation uh, along the sides uh, is uh, starting to turn towards winter, uh, wintering a little bit, which is a little early. It seems to be a, a little, a little uh, 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 thicker and a little bit more uh, darker green than you would have expected. Uh, and in particular, as you get closer, you notice that there are bursts of, um, of dark green vegetation that are growing up around the building as well. There also seems to be a, a thin fog that's setting in and a little bit of chill um, as you get higher, a little bit more than you might have expected. As we approach, uh, Silas is going to put up a silent image around us to make it look as though the wagon is kind of underwater uh, and there's like a waviness to it and then uh, it will pull up and then that waviness will kind of go with the two as they step out of the wagon. Um, and he'll also disguise self to look like just a strange fish man, fisherman person, uh, <laughs> completely not Silas looking. Okay. Pretty sure a fish man's going to get attention and probably get killed. <laughs> ah, he's in disguise. <laughs> he's, he's wearing his fish uh, costume, uh, fish cosplay. <laughs> yep. Okay. Like, it looks like a costume. <laughs> okay. So it is, you are trying to look like you are costumed then. In that case. Uh, yeah, he okay. basically is looking like, like the driver has dressed up as well. Okay. Odega raises a very distinct eyebrow, um, kind of, well, actually, she has her mask on, so you can't see a distinct eyebrow, but there's a cock of the head, which you feel like the same sort of uh, impression is being given, uh, that she's surprised at first, but then kind of sees the reaction of the different uh, servants as you're approaching, uh, and they seem to be quite impressed with the, the illusion. Uh, you do notice a couple of the guards tense a little bit as they see this very strange thing coming forward. Um, but uh, uh, it seems to having a, 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 an impression, if not necessarily all uh, positive, it certainly is impressing people. Uh, and the, the stable boy just directs you to, or actually leads the wagon with the horses over to the side after Odiga and Athanos have, have, uh, have gotten out. Uh, and then basically they'll, they'll attend to it so you don't have to wait with them. Uh, there is no, <laughs> there is no place for the servants to stand, however, so it's a little bit awkward uh, as uh, they just kind of look at you and then they go off to, you know, get some water, get some oats and attend to them. Kind of, you're effectively invisible in some ways to them now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he'll just go off and find a corner to lean against for a while. Okay. Out of everyone notice. Easy enough done. Of the building itself, as you ride up, um, as I mentioned, it's, it's two floors. Uh, it's about, I believe, uh, I want to say, I think it's, 80 feet wide. So it's a fairly wide building. Uh, on the second floor in the side that you're coming from, which is essentially the eastern side, you can see the second floor windows um, are, um, or the second floor has a large bay window with multiple windows in it. Many of them seem to be tinted green. Uh, and you can see that there's uh, a little bit of light moving within. Most of the second floor seems to be dark, but it's also not that dark outside just yet. Um, let's see. Annie would be next with the, uh, the steward at the back kind of uh, being there. 
Um, does Annie try to make conversation along the way? Verendel seems a bit distracted, partially it seems by uh, Annie's outfit, but there seems to be other things weighing on his mind. Uh, I'll, I'll try to make like light conversation like, have you been? Like, it, she is also very like awkward. <laughs> okay. Is Andy awkward going, and distracted. Is Andy going to fish to figure out whether he's read the note or not? Um. Yeah, I I think I'd be be upfront with it. Like, I I see you received my letter. I have. I I figured you you were owed a bit more of an explanation, than stressed out panic. I admit to be somewhat, to being somewhat floored, at the time. It may not have been my best reaction. And he kind of leans in a little bit and under his breath, Your Highness. I, it went about as well as I kind of expected. So I wasn't very surprised. I was. And I'm kind of kicking myself that I was. You fooled me. And that makes me wonder whether I've been fooled before by other people. It was not necessarily my intention to fool people. And that's basically all the explanation I have. I'll keep your secret. I appreciate that. But let's try not to have too many more major surprises. I've had enough of those over the last year. As I've said, others than this, I've been truthful. I promise. Then perhaps I should also be truthful. He pulls off his face. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no, um, he was the diamond the entire time <laughs> i had thought about that early on it's like how could i do this right underneath your nose okay oh, <laughs> um i am concerned for the baron and baroness i am bound by oath to serve them But I have been questioning my oath. This puts me in a difficult position. I don't know what's going on. And none of the letters that I've sent back to Alaria have been answered. Do you know anything more about them? Not nothing comes to mind. Uh, I know that uh, Gaetano has said that he's going to make sure that it is brought to uh, the Queen's attention. Uh, but I, we get so many correspondence that things do sometimes get buried. And Sable was kind of worried too, but. You hear a voice whispering through the wind. <laughs> um, but it, it, it has been a concerning situation that I have brought up in my last correspondence with them and that Gaetano has also uh, said that he would bring up. So I have sworn an allegiance to the Baron and Baroness. I have sworn an allegiance to the realm But there is a third allegiance that I must come truthful to you about. Mm -hmm. I belong to an organization, one that spans much of Omatia. Its history has been mostly forgotten now, unfortunately. But 
there are those of us who wish to make sure that evil does not make it into the world. It is an old oath, one which I took when I was a much younger man, and which I have not been called to fulfill for a long time. You may have heard of it, given your position, but if we've done our work correctly, you have not. It is called the Order of the Green. The Green Guard! Just knew it! We share information where we can, and we try to bring attention where we can. I have been reporting to them everything that's happened here in this town. To be truthful, it's one of the reasons I was stationed here several years ago. Much to Riemann's dismay. I see. Despite my different loyalties, I wanted you to know that. And that I mean nothing against the realm, but of the concerning rumors that I've heard about the Baron and Baroness, I may have to break that oath. And that will put me into a difficult position. That is understandable. Um... As I said, I'm concerned with the situation as well. Uh, and I don't think any less of you if anything were to happen. I wanted there to be no more secrets between the two of us. You know about my family, at least as much as I've bothered to tell. Mm -hmm. They were much more prominent the family has grown decadent over the many decorate many centuries <laughs> or more i'm still trying to understand what the great confusion means in terms of time but <clears throat> if it becomes relevant and i'm not saying that it is relevant at this particular moment or mm -hmm. that it, it is necessary, or, 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 or that it... And you see him stumble over his words a little bit for some reason. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I am considered of noble birth. Should what that be important? Smirk, smirk. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. I kind of like nod awkwardly <laughs> as well. She she's like super anxious, doesn't know how to deal with this either. So, um, he picks up his mask and starts examining all the small details in it very very minutely, looking at every single little, completely distracting himself from the moment we're trying to. <laughs> and now we go back to both being. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's just an awkward quiet trip up the up the hill. Awesome. Um, by the time you arrive, the sun has pretty much fully set. Darkness is uh, uh, clouding the hill. The fog that I described that, that Silas had noticed when first uh, coming up there has now thickened considerably and now lays upon like a, uh, a thin gray sheet over everything on the side of the hill. Uh, you too may also make a nature roll, uh, an insight roll with disadvantage though now. Me? Yes. You said you two, am I arriving yet? or? No. Sorry, you as well Which... shall make okay. the, <laughs> this roll. Sorry, didn't mean to confuse. Okay. So a, a nature and, invest, uh, and insight, you said? Yep. Insight a disadvantage and the nature roll. Okay, insight okay well, that's is double nines for oh, that. So 10 for the insight. <laughs> if you roll an 11 for nature, it's just going to be a perfect for this group. Wow. I, got I have rolled three nines. Three. Wow. Okay. All three of my, ro all, all three of my rolls were nine. So that is 10 and 10. Wow. Okay. 
So uh, 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 insight should be plus nine, not plus five. So uh, at disadvantage would be eleven. Okay. Fifteen. But the nature roll, which is minus one modifier, is eighteen. So. Okay. Yeah. I'll, de I'll describe for you because you're running a little bit later because of the dance lesson. The sun is back, motherfuckers. <laughs> um, Annie, as you're riding up, and both of both you and Verandell are basically studying what's outside of the window, probably as much as what's inside, trying to not notice each other for a little while, being a little bit calm. Maybe you know, while the temperature outside feels nice and cool, and you can stick your your face out the window a little bit to get a little cool air, because it feels rather warm in this cab for some reason. Uh, at the moment, um, as the the sort of uh, uh, as you pass by the the trees and tall grass that's going along the sides of the Ravens Bluff, and you're going up, and you can see the the fog kind of inter interlacing with it, um, you get the impression that that um, fall must be coming sooner here than anywhere else. Because the, the 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 trees seem to sag a little bit from one side to the other, and the 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 fog almost has a, a weird greenish tint as well, where it me meshes with these dark green fronds of, of grass. Um, you see uh, uh, a a deer kind of pop in from the side from uh, from uh, the thick grass, kind of look towards you. And then uh, you see it running away, but it seems to stumble a little bit as it moves. Uh, almost wavering back and forth, uh, uncertainly. Um, is the deer drunk? I mean, from this distance, what does it take for a deer to be drunk? I, you're kind of like that's one explanation. So if they're if they're getting the deer drunk, how does it work for us? I guess is that where the rivers shall run with run red with the wine? I guess. Um, for the insight check, uh, more people have arrived now, and you can see a bit of a hubbub outside. And, and you see that everybody is kind of pulling on their masks as they get out. So the, 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 the masquerade, if you will, starts at the very beginning. You're not sure why this was created as a masquerade ball, but it seemed very insistent and very deliberate. And you can also see that there are, are these enormous uh, headdresses and different things that people are wearing, um, as well as see some, some very odd ones. Um, there's a, a, a couple and, and people haven't been let in yet. They're still sort of milling about this courtyard with this, uh, uh, fountain in the middle. And you see one couple that has this, uh, what looks like, uh, ribbons of iridescent blue flowing down along their body and their, their, their mask is what looks like an entire head of a large snake and kind of pacing beside that person is what appears to be a, a mobile, pile of fishing nets uh, along the side uh, and and kind of has this this glaring <laughs> look of bright eyes in the center of it that seem to be picking up whatever uh, whatever torchlight um, there are some uncovered uh, permanent lanterns now which have been brought out which have uh, uh, perpetual flame spells essentially uh, they're they're kind of always burning and they just uncover them at nighttime to give the whole era. And there's, there's a bit of discussion uh, there as well. Uh, you see uh, uh, someone you instantly recognize as Arwen Cartwright, uh, the rather large, uh, rotund uh, um, um, businessman. Uh, his voice comes very clearly through, and even his mask is not really all that fancy. Uh, it's, it's kind of just a, a covering over his uh, eyes, it looks like it's been studded with multiple gems and things. It looks very, very expensive, but it's also nothing particularly fancy. Um, he's wearing a, a large collar. He's got uh, a very nice uh, coat on, which has uh, greens and yellows and blues throughout it. You're not sure what theme he was going for other than I am Ardwin Cartwright and you know me damn uh, kind of thing. Um, and he has a very young woman on his arm, um, which at first you might mistake for his daughter and tell you remember that his daughter is supposed to be here with, uh, with, uh, Medrick and, but looking around, you don't notice them. Um, uh, Verandell has put on his mask at this particular point and it's a little awkward because the, the point of the unicorn horn is it's, it's, it's considerable height. So once he puts it on, it gets a little bit awkward to get out of the handsome cab, which aren't very big, but he does manage to kind of do it with that 
um, that almost supernatural elven flex that they have. The, the, the I'm awkward, but I will never look awkward kind of feature of true elves. Um, you're muted. I said, yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but once he is able to come out and, and because you know him and because you saw him start, you know how awkward the step was, but he seems to land very, very comfortably, walk around to the other side, open the door and, uh, and lead you out of the, of the cab. Um, the, and you already have your mask on. Yeah, um, it, it it needed to be on so I could get my hair to fall and cover the right, straps. Right. <laughs> um, and as you take a few steps out, um, you notice that there's a bit of a of a hush that goes on the crowd as they start to notice you, and you realize that um, the horn on the mask glows a little. And in fact, it is sort of illuminating you at that particular moment as you as you exit from the uh, the cab. Uh, and there's a bit of a hush that comes up, and a and a few, particularly from that strange serpent serpent headed one. There's a sort of swear under the breath kind of thing that comes out. Uh, not not so much much from the pile of of uh, of uh, of nets beside her. Um, Silas, you you've been watching different people arrive here and there in the thickening of the fog, uh, and then uh, you. It's hard to miss Verendel himself. Um, his stature is pretty strong, and the the, the 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 unicorn horn is pretty large. But then afterwards, you see him uh, arrive with someone, uh, and it takes you a moment to realize it might be Annie because you've never seen her in this particular light. Uh, both the unicorn light as well as just the the dress itself. So you make an impression. I'm in my element. <laughs> I've done this my entire life. This is like second nature. <laughs> Verendel offers his arm and... Is it... Would it be considered odd for people to be expected to stay in the courtyard before an event like this? Um, make, me, make me an appropriate uh, etiquette type role. History would apply... Um, but if you have something else that would make more sense, then certainly you can do that as well. I mean, history would be probably what I would do. I'm just trying to sing. Yeah. Because you would have also had to study the sort of etiquette at court that had been happening over the built-up etiquette of, of lords and ladies and barons and baronesses. Uh, year, years of etiquette lessons. Mm. Uh, that is 18. 18? Um. There are a number of reasons you know that that might happen. Maybe the hall wasn't ready yet, and so they were they were mm -hmm. uh, stressing on that. Maybe there was some other reason to keep people outside here in particular because it is a good mm -hmm. mingling spot as well. Uh, maybe they wanted to time this in particular with some sort of presentation, or they wanted to. You know, the The invitation itself uh, is kind of the you know doors open at seven, show at nine o'clock kind of kind of thing. Um, yeah. So there is an official time when things start. But it does seem a little bit odd to keep people here. Um, and as you're kind of looking... Usually looking... there would be like a reset, like, uh, and like atrium before the reception area. Yeah, something like that. Uh, but they seem to be, be holding off for the moment. Um, and now the third arrival, Medric. Your, div deter your divergence of a, uh, of a lesson for dancing having been completed... It was a surprising workout for the amount that the, this seems like a pleasure activity. Your legs are, are feeling a little bit sore because this is not the way you normally have to move. Um, and it, 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 you'll, you may gain a little bit of an appreciation of this as a martial art. Nice. <laughs> Dancing itself might be a martial art. Uh, Melora <laughs> is a, uh, a skilled dancer, which surprises you a little bit, given that she's normally a bit rough. She likes to ride caver caravans. Why is she that good? I don't know if you confront her about that. I'll or ask not. her that. Yeah. Uh, my father had ambitions that I would marry a count one day. Or a baron. Or a lord. Or a prince. We have different thoughts on the matter. <laughs> You're not sure if that was a slight because apparently you rate lower than all of them. But <laughs> Yeah, it's like I kind of want to ask, but I kind of don't because then it'll be awkward. 
and as you ride up in the painting, and it's wagon, like, is she wanting to marry me? Is she not? Like, what does that mean exactly? <laughs> so I'll just kind of like laugh. Um, and yeah, she she joins in the laughter. There's that moment of hesitation before she laughs it off. Um, so sure. why did you invite me to the party? <laughs> I mean, I am grateful. It's... You're the one with the invite. She. <laughs> yeah, she she invited herself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wait, I thought she she invited me to the party. Like, oh, at the urging of uh, of uh, Silas, a number of women uh, invited themselves onto your ticket, but she okay. was the one that won. Okay, I didn't yeah. even realize I had a ticket. <laughs> yeah, you you had an invitation directly, but yes. Okay. Um, uh, Melora and then would... she decided okay, so that she was. Okay, so let's take that question back. One. Yeah. Um, well, along the same lines, Melora would tell you that. Um, the opportunity for this uh, this um, access would not come along very easily. And I wanted to make sure that I was the one who went over all of those others. So the competitive spirit is clearly there. Um, mm -hmm. And you get the impression that she, she jumped on the opportunity knowing that others would as well. And she made, she kind of intimidated you into it, but at the same time, uh, <laughs> uh, she made her, her point, made her point across. Well, if shit's go if, if shit's gonna go down the if shit's gonna go down at the party, then I'd rather have a strong person to, at my side. So that's good for her. <laughs> so um, you arrive towards the party, and they have not yet opened up the doors. You're about a half an hour after everyone else uh, has already mm -hmm. been uh, been there, and at this point, uh, uh, Annie and Silas, you see that the courtyard is getting pretty full. Um, they, they probably invited about uh, 30 or 40 people um, plus guests, so um, it's a fairly large uh, uh, group. Um, Medrick, the two things that you rolled, you rolled, uh, it was, it was 18, uh, 15 for nature, for in, yeah, 18 for nature, but 15 for insight. 15 I should have rolled insight. plus nine. Okay. Um, so the nature one, first of all, as you're riding up, and now it is quite dark, um, Every once in a while, uh, I believe it's Kara, looks mm -hmm. back from where she's riding because you do glow. <laughs> you glow, especially in the dark. Uh, so it's a little distracting for, for her. Even Melora's kind of a bit impressed because she had not realized this as well. She's only seen you during the day when everything else is on fire. Um, <laughs> but it is a pretty impressive effect as you kind of have this, this built-in glow uh, riding up. Um, by this point now, the fog has become quite considerably thick uh, to the point where it's even hard to see the sides of the road uh, and the road itself disappears after a certain period of time. Um, as you're kind of glancing uh, to each side and seeing the, 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 uh, the nature as you're passing by, the trees and the grass and so forth, um, you notice that the... The grass is looking a little bit sickly, in fact. And there's a bit of a smell that's being carried on the fog, which you hadn't really noticed before. Uh, it, it almost smells like decay. It smells like uh, uh, not the kind of smell you would expect from this high elevation forest and grass. This grassland at, at most would smell kind of uh, lighter of hay or would smell of the, the delightful wood, that sort of thing. But everything here seems to smell a bit different. In fact, it smells more like um, more like a bog or swamp than you might expect, which seems very strange. You I'll also mentioned that, and just so Melora is aware of it, it's like, why does it smell like a swamp in here, out here, whatever? And she kind of takes a, a breath in, wrinkles her forehead. I don't know. And there's not much other that she can add to that. She's not a, an outdoor expert at all, although she knows the caravans. And she is paying attention to it now that you've called her attention to it. Uh, and you can see that that wrinkle in her forehead persists as she's trying to trying to work it out. The other thing you notice is that the deepening of the shadows, both with the fog itself and with the, the, the night uh, moving on, the both of the moons are starting to crest across the horizon. Uh, and they are going to be in uh, um, 
they're going to be balanced against each other, which means they're both going to be uh, uh, half moons, opposite half moons for this particular evening. And that always means that the light is somewhat weird. It's being reflected from two different directions and causes all kinds of weird shadows to happen. Um, but nonetheless, kind of noticing that and noticing those, those, uh, the moons kind of high enough now to start to cast their light, the shadows do not feel quite right in the trees and the grass around you. They seem to shake and shiver in ways that are counter to the light of the moon. Nothing specific that you can see. It just makes a, a weird cast on the entire evening. Uh, would I have anything like in religious lore about what the double half or opposite half moons mean? Um, make a religion check. All right. Ignis Which tends is like to, only a plus two, but still. Ignis tends to I ignore most like, of the night side, but there are things that would be taught among the among the. Oh, Indians. that's a seven. Seven. <laughs> so that's yeah. probably like, oh, that's so weird. Like the moons, they they go like this. And and, and the shadows are weird, but clearly it's just a coincidence. It's one of those things where you do know there's lore about the moons, but again, Ignians don't tend to study that nearly as much. Um, if anything, most of the lore of the moons is how the power derives from Ignis. Mm -hmm. Um, and so half moons tend to be where Ignis's waning power is. The fact that both moons are half might mean that Ignis's power is even more diminished. Well, it that's an, not nice. It is an unusual <laughs> occurrence. You, that much you know is that this does not happen very often. Um, and... Melora kind of looks up at it and, went, and looks at it and goes, well, they are kind of nice. You know, the way that they're balanced against each other. She yeah, I suppose. She doesn't have any kind of it. knowledge about that, but just sort of appreciate it. On, trying to figure out why you brought it to her attention and she's trying, you can get the impression of she's, she's trying to figure out why you brought it up as in like, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Is that, is that what I'm supposed to notice? Um, she seems a little less certain in this particular instance. It's like talking about the weather, <laughs> except you can't see the weather, so you got to talk about the moon. <laughs> <laughs> so as you arrive, uh, Silas, you've been paying attention to kind of the crowd and the area and everything like that. Um, you've noticed from time to time that um, a few of the lights on the second floor uh, come on, but then they quickly go off. Lights would probably be somewhat similar to what they're using here, which is basically continual flame torches. Um, or continual flame lanterns, which are always burning, but you basically put a cover over them when you don't want the light on. Um, yeah. Does it look like there's a particular? Uh, does it look like a repeating order of lights? Like there's a guard going around and flicking on a light, checking, then turning it off, then going to the next room and flicking on a light, or is it just random? Um, make a perception check. Twenty-four. Okay. Nice. Um, there does not appear to be any particular pattern to it. You get the impression that it's probably just shift changes and that more and more people are being brought on to service. A few things might be, a few people might be looking for something, um, in their, in their rooms. And then when they get dark, um, they're closed off. Given that all the folks are in the courtyard, however, um, these cannot be, or probably aren't guests. They're probably servants quarters on the second floor. Um, do you are you staying in the one spot through this time? You're going to have a couple of hours to wait before the party seems to get going. Uh, well, he'll walk around a bit. Uh, in particular, he'll look for a spot that's kind of out of the way, uh, and look for a balcony that he can teleport up to. Uh, okay. For once, he does go in. Uh, so he's scouting out a safe path there. Um, okay. There are a few other guests who've also gotten maybe bored of standing around or taking a tour around. Um, the far end of the building looks out across uh, at the end of the, of the peak of, of uh, Raven's Bluff. It's only a, a, a few dozen yards from the actual peak itself. You also notice that there are patrols running around the building. Um, not running, but rather moving around the building. Uh, two guards at a time, and you've seen a number of those patrols, so they have a considerable number of guards, and they seem to be out and ready. 
Um, they're not bothering the guests at all and tend to stay a bit further away from the building, uh, whereas the guests are taking this path. You do notice that on the sides of the buildings, there are uh, uh, worn down grass ruts, essentially where, where uh, 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 wagons will be brought to the back. Um, as you come around to the back of it, you notice that on the first and second floor, there is a, 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 a not balcony, but a, a um, essentially a, a large bay window on both, both uh, levels. Um, with mostly green, some blue, and some other colored glass that's in them. They seem to be brightly lit up. You can see on the first floor as you look in, um, there does seem to be uh, a band that's setting up. Um, they're all wearing their masks. There's a, 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 a harpist who's uh, tuning their harp and a couple of other uh, that are kind of getting ready. That's up on the first floor, which is actually elevated from where you are because the ground dips a little bit behind the the uh, building, and you can see this gravel, which was placed towards the opening of the basement, which looks like it's a, a, a big set of two double doors that can be expanded out to allow somebody to bring things into the basement. You have a feeling that they probably uh, put uh, a wagon or carts down there underneath the building, uh, probably also where storage happens to be. You see there are a number of doors yeah. on the outside as well. Um Lights are on on the first floor, and on the second floor of that back uh, balcony, um, you see that there is um, a, a bit of dim light, and you make out a silhouette of someone standing and looking out towards the sea. Um, you can't make out details the way that the glass is, is uh, warbled a little bit in the, from the distance, uh, but it does strike you as being uh, a broad-shouldered individual, a humanoid of some kind, um, standing fairly, fairly tall. It would be a safe bet that this is probably the Baron um, mm. looking out towards the sea. Um, and as you circum circumnavigate around towards the front, uh, on the far right-hand side, you see a beautiful glassed-in space, which is a semi-dome which exists on, on one side. This would be the, uh, the sort of north, uh, yeah, basically northeastern corner or on our map. It's on the, on the, the, uh, the, southeast um, our, our map is not north south oriented for those who are, are curious the map is actually one I've got in roll 20 which unfortunately uh, Silas can't or Pat can't look at the moment but I'm, I'm trying to describe that there is a, a large glass dim what looks like almost an observatory where it's extended out a little bit from the building there's clear glass on the top and, and on the sides uh, and you can see a pedestal on the inside um, looks like it's a mostly empty room and then as you move around to the front again um, you can see that second floor balcony, uh, the sort of extended space that's out uh, uh, above. All of these are enclosed. There's no open balconies in this building. Uh, but the second floor one with mostly green light, you can see another figure kind of standing uh, there, much sl slimmer than the other, kind of pacing a little bit back and forth. And from that position, whoever is there could easily watch over the courtyard and watch all the people as they arrive. Okay. Um, uh, Silas is also taking a look at what people are wearing uh, so that he can recreate the servant's uniforms if he needs to uh, appear as a servant. Um, okay. And just, to, just the different kinds of things people are wearing so that at some point he might need to pretend to be one of the nobles so he'll kind of slightly, uh, he'll roughly copy one of them possibly um so he's trying to just check out what people are wearing um you don't have to give me any specifics or anything this that's what he's looking at um and he will send a message to annie and then medrick um saying uh uh i'm here so are my aunt and uncle Apparently they were invited. I'm not sure why. Uh, the Baron seems to be at the back of the building looking out to sea. And I'm pretty sure it's the Baroness is watching all of you people at the front from one of the upper windows. And I hope repeat that for Medrick. Can we respond to that? Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's the my, second one. He probably my takes a couple of those. Is... My response is, so that's the fish net people. 
But uh, the, the fifth what? The fishnet people. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, give me a... Let's call this an investigation check as you're trying to get the details of the of the servants' dresses, the servants' clothes, and some of the, the nobles. Um, while um, there are many varied costumes, costumes based on birds, there's at least one person who's got what looks like a stag's outfit, like with even fairly uh, rudimentary large horns. With someone else, it uh, looks like the, 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 a tall man wearing uh, what looks like a, a, a large horned outfit and paired with someone who's wearing what looks like almost a doe's outfit. Uh, there's many, many colors. There's some which are much more conservative. Um, none of the outfits are quite as abstract as Odega and Athenos's outfits. Um, and you see that there are people going up and talking to them, but mostly not. And you see mostly it would be uh, Odega going to talk to them and uh, trying to make a conversation. How did your your uh, investigation uh, Net go? 20. Net 20. That's a 23 total. You're absolutely certain that you could replicate what the look of the servants' outfits is. They have a fairly consistent look. It's all a, a sort of deep blue with white and that, that crest on their chest. Um, and there's a couple of, of different people you could uh, pretty pretty easily and, and reliably be able to pull off the outfits. Um, sure. Yeah, he's just doing prep work while he waits. When the Phoenix champion uh, then, arrives, sorry. Sorry, uh, this, he'll go back to a spot near the shed. Okay. Um, when the Phoenix champion arrives, first of all, people can see you coming for quite some time, even with the fog. There is this light which is growing. Do you moderate that light at all? No, I'll just let the anticipation build. Okay. <laughs> um, Kara up front is is sort of sitting a little bit more proud. There's this there's this weird th feeling of as you guys come into view and the crowd starts to take notice one or two at a time. She's noticing that they're taking notice, technically of you, but at the same time she's sort of in the pathway of notice. And so she sits up a little straighter and it's like, oh, this is this is real now. Well, the uh, chariot looks fabulous and she's driving the chariot. So she's also deserving of that notice. Well, she does. Thank you. I, I painted it myself uh, earlier today. And Melora just shoots her daggers eyes front. Um, I was but, about to say you, you did a great job at Melora shooting her daggers. It's like, <laughs> I'll just nod. Uh, <laughs> Kara brings the wagon, kind of brings it and turns it around so you can you can dismount from, dismount from the side. Um, you can see all the other carriages that are here. Uh, this one is probably the most, uh, well, it would be the most primitive, but you see a completely unpainted wagon over to one other side, um, which is kind of being tended to. Uh, and, you know, but the, the, the color looks nice. And you kind of also notice as you, as you get out of the wagon that some of the paint has a shimmery effect into it. You kind of yeah. imagine they've ground some seashells or something into the paint itself to give it a little bit of opalescence. Um, nice. But now that the the uh, uh, the Phoenix champion has arrived, there is a uh, a a cheer for the Phoenix champion that seems to be coming from somewhere in the crowd, uh, which gets picked up. Uh, all hail the Phoenix champion! Kind of gets spoken. And as it's you, like, oh shit! As you uh, kind of pressure, <laughs> as you kind of feel this uh, coming, you're picking out a couple of things. One, um, you actually notice uh, the image or the the figure standing on the second floor behind the green glass, mm -hmm. uh, the sort of slight feminine figure. You notice it kind of diminish and move away, as if she backed away quickly from the glass. Um, you notice that the the uh, there is a significant security presence. There's a lot of guards that are out uh, and seem to be uh, very well armed, uh, mostly with uh, uh, swords on hip and with uh, the uh, staves as well. Uh, their armor also looks like it has been polished and cleaned and made perfect for the most part. There are a few notable examples and uh, notable exceptions of where armor looks um, 
uh, scuffed and worn and probably used heavily. Um, picking out probably the people who have had the most experience. Um, everybody is gathered together in this one space. There's a sense of anticipation and a little bit of um, boredom as well. You also notice the glowing horn on the uh, on the head of one person besides someone you're pretty sure is Annie, but that does not look like Annie, and it's mm. a little bit weird to take it out, but the, the glowing horn definitely uh, uh, gives you an indication as well of someone's um, importance. Uh, and Melora takes your arm, kind of, the while you're looking around the crowd, evaluating everything, she kind of takes your arm. Shall we? Well, certainly. And I'll just like wave at the crowd because they acknowledge me, so I'll acknowledge them. It's a bit of a, of and a then I'll just, Yeah. And it's at that point that the front doors open wide, uh, letting in a considerable amount of light. Um, Wait, for how long have you guys been waiting here? I'll ask a random like person next to me. The response is simply, ages. Apparently you're the guest of honor. Huh, that's weird. And I thought I was late. Fashionably late, I guess I was fashionably early. And you, you kind of feel Melora's hand pat you on, on the arm. Sometimes people will wait for the important people. Does she see me blush? Uh, what does it look like <laughs> when someone who's who's slightly glowing uh, all the time blushes? Is it is it like a... It, sh it, should, it shouldn't look like anything, which is what I want. <laughs> um, make me a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's call be this a deception. A sure a deception. There you go. I'm gonna try. I'm to not cover blushing this. at all. I'm. Not... Um. There's no way I can be that important. Fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah, you 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 start to blush, and so you kind of instinctually uh, flare up a little bit with the uh, the light and heat, and it kind of covers the whole thing, and just looks like you're being impressive at that moment. Uh, but cool, the door, cool. Walk along. <laughs> the doors open up, and I will switch to the other page just so that uh, people can get an impression of the map. I think we're going to be um, introducing things a little bit, but that we're probably going to be um, calling this to a, a momentary close for the night. I know that's a little bit. Uh, it's been a short session with a lot of other things, not as much action as usual, but uh, we've been kind of getting back into it. Um, that is the impression of the main floor of uh, the uh, of the building. The darkened areas are just rooms you can't see from where you are. Um, you can see the two main hallways that run uh, the north and south. Um, shoot, what I, uh, I think I'd call them passageways. Uh, galleries, sorry, the north and south galleries, which are the two long hallways that run on either side of the main, main uh, space. The main area itself is quite large. Uh, it contains uh, basically white marble that's been that's been brought in. Although most everything has been made out of wood, there is stone that reinforces much of the building. Uh, those areas on left and right are actually um, check-in areas, coat checks, um, where there are servants ready to take your uh, any additional clothing you might have. Uh, there is a, a line of guards there as well, however, insisting that any weapons must be left behind. Um, for the safety of everyone. Uh, if you have any obvious weapons, that would be something they would request. Uh, but if they don't see any weapons, they aren't necessarily going to ask you about it. Well, they ask everybody about it, but... Um, uh, the Through the main center, you can see there are two staircases lead up to either in either direction, uh, up to a second floor, which has a small opening of, above it. Um, below the stairways are actually um, uh, what look like uh, common washrooms, um, there are uh, two of them on this, or four of them on this floor, um, single single person washrooms essentially, um, for everyone's use. Um, and then beyond that, you can also see some hallways off to the left and right as well on the right hand side, I should say, uh, not left and right. Um, and then the main ballroom is far beyond through a, a double sets of double doors, um, which is also uh, white marble inlaid with black marble. Uh, in the shape of a massive uh, raven, uh, raven or crow. Um, and then you do, again, you're kind of remembering some of the, the local lore about this being Raven's Bluff, and the Baron is the Raven Baron. 
Um, and that's where most people start to, to, uh, to gather and move in. Um, Silas, you see everybody start to, to move in and the guards kind of move into the area to help move them in and help, uh, uh, you, you don't get the impression it's kind of sinister so much as there are people wandering all about and they're trying to corral them to get them into the party, <laughs> uh, trying to act like, uh, like, uh, uh, tour guides as much as anything else. Yeah. Um, you also see that that figure who was up above has definitely vanished, uh, well, just gone. <laughs> Not that they vanished so much as you don't see them in the window anymore. You only had a vague outline anyway. Um, and you can hear the, the band start to play a little bit and the sound starts to carry throughout the, uh, throughout the, uh, the building for the evening. Um, uh, let's see. Probably the f- final step for today, for today. How long is Silas planning to wait before he tries to go in? Um, well, he'll, he'll wait till everyone is in there. Uh, so there's not so much outside. Um, and he'll just keep an eye on the place. I mean, he's effectively there as a servant. Well, he's just the driver right now. Mm-hmm. Um, in and his in, weird costume. In that open courtyard area, um, the servants and guards are, are chatting back and forth. It's kind of that level of, we all know what our stature is here. None of us are above any uh, each other. So it's much more... Uh, common level for them to discuss things so it gets to once the once the important people have gone inside the real people outside are starting to calm down a little bit Mm. um uh one thing i wanted to note uh uh he is what uh, he does have his shield on his back and he does have the staff but the staff looks like a walking stick uh, in his current disguise um, what does the shield look like? Is it kind of just part of the cloak? It's just covered up by the fishman costume. Okay. It looks like a big chubby fishman. Um. Yeah, I, I don't know if he has much to. Uh, he'll probably listen in a bit there, but he'll stay inconspicuous, and presumably they're just talking about normal stuff. Okay, it is a lot of normal stuff that's going on. A lot of a uh, lot of discussion of of how long it took them to get ready, and you know why were we waiting out here so long? And and uh, I've never been here before. You know, is it possible to go for a tour? And then they get the slap on the back of the head. Tour? This is the Baron's estate. Um, make a perception check as you're out there. Actually, uh, let's make a perception and an insight check. There's two different things. Twenty-one perception. Nice. Huh. Uh, Twenty insight. Nice. Yeah, nineteen on the die. So, um, with the perception, the fog has started to become extraordinarily thick outside of the courtyard. It seems like the courtyard is is uh, an area where not much of it has actually penetrated all that uh, very much. Um, but it definitely is swirling all outside of the, the, uh, the walkways on the side and then obscuring entirely the forest, uh, and the trees and the, the, the grasslands that are outside. Um, but nonetheless, you're seeing motion out in those trees. Um, most of it seems to be small. Most of it seems to be, uh, uh, a little here and there, not continuous motion, but it's definitely more than you would have expected. And once the fog got thicker and once everybody went inside, it seems to have uh, been agitated even more. Um, you're not sure what to make of it from here. Um, and you can make out no particular shapes. Uh, but it seems like more than you would have expected. Um, for the insight, while there are um, a number of the guards kind of palling around with the servants that are here, um, you do notice a couple of the guards... Um, who are, uh, one of them is in considerably rougher armor, um, which seems to be, uh, everybody, all the other guards seem to be somewhat deferent to. Uh, you can see short, uh, very gray uh, hair on the sides, 
uh, deep wrinkles, a few scars on his face. Um, clearly carries himself as uh, a person in charge, but also well-equipped, uh, well understanding his weapons. Uh, and he seems to be going around and talking to a number of the guards, uh, a number of the groups of guards, essentially, and one or two of them peel off with him each time until he's gathered about six people. Uh, and then uh, he gathers them to talk over at the far end of the court, or out towards the, the road, uh, and seems to be uh, uh, giving them some sort of uh, uh, urgent, um, angry orders, I guess. His voice comes off as a bit, bit rough, but you don't hear much of the details swallowed up by the fog. Uh, but there's a definite sense of tension and of concern. Silence will try to sidle closer and listen in a bit. Okay. I'll take a uh, stealth roll. Mm. Ten. Ten? Yeah. Um, as you're starting to move closer, um, you notice that this, this older gentleman, the one that seems to be in charge looks directly over at you and stops talking um, and kind of raises his head to question if there's something you want. Um, so this was a, um, did, did you see that someone out in the, out, out in the woods? Uh, it's like, that's, I mean, I, I'm just here with my, I mean, my cousins, to be honest. Uh, actually, yeah, he'll just say cousins. It's not actually cousins, but um, but this place, is it always this creepy up here? So what what are you intending to do? What's the intention behind this? Are you trying to he's, trick them, to goad them? to uh, One, he's trying to just come off as basically scared kid that's worried about because this place is creepy uh, and other to see if they feel that this thing that's going on is unusual or if this just seems to be another night in the on guard duty. Okay. Um, let's call that a persuasion check. Let's see if you can get on the right side of what they're, what they're looking for. 14. 14. Okay. You do see a number of glances between the other guards as they're they're kind of reacting to the statements you're making. Um, the one in front of you, the older guard, does not react um, and just kind of uh, growls a little bit uh, in frustration. None of your business. Everything here is just fine. And then he kind of uh, glances towards the other the others. Go about Go your along. duties. See here. And kind of orders them to go about their their duties. They do not head back into the courtyard, however, but start to move in threes. So there's basically two groups of three uh, in opposite <clears throat> directions around the outside of the of the building. Uh, and they're definitely looking for something, and they're definitely they're definitely reading as nervous. What you said to them uh, kind of feels like it made them a little bit more nervous as if it was not just uh, something which um, they were mistaken in noticing. Um, the, other, the other guard in front of you um, uh, just says, so what did you think you saw? I don't know. Just It's like movement, but I mean, I mean no, in, normally in the fog, like you won't see, stuff, see much. Uh, I don't know. It just just felt weird. Well, if you see anything more specific, you come find me. There's bound to be a few thieves in a fog, especially where there's so much, so much in one place. You can make an insight check. Natural 20. So <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, he's not concerned he's angry he's not worried about thieves in fact when he says the word thieves it almost comes out as a joke 
There's that little subtle sort of thing of, of, uh, of um, I'm not worrying about thieves. Thieves are the least of my worries. Mm. Um, but he's angry uh, as though uh, he's not been, as though he's not been listened to. And okay. as, though he, as though he's now been confirmed of what he what he was uh, thinking. Well, so that's just it. Well, um, well uh, uh, thank you, sir. I'll just uh, I'll just go back and and, and uh, wait. Don't you uh, worry. Thank you. And then just back off. Now, uh, this place, it's a mansion with another building. It's not like a castle or like a, a keep. Are, like, are there any walls or anything, like uh, defensive walls, or is it just mansion on top of a, a point? It, it's just a mansion on top of a point. You get the impression that because it's fairly remote, it's it's easier to defend. You don't need walls when it's hard to even get to. Um, although the road is relatively straight now, um, there are boulders along the sides that basically mean you can't just march an entire army up here. There will be choke points. But, okay. the, but it is it is basically a mansion. The other building is closer to like a warehouse style building. It's not it's not a fancy building at all. It's made of wood. It was made probably fairly cheaply, uh, and definitely is more of a of an outer building. Okay. Um, yeah. When Silas gets back to his quiet corner behind one of the buildings, uh, he'll send another message to. Uh, to the two of them in turn uh just saying um it, see try and make sure it's 25 words um is that sending or is yeah that... it's sending so i gotta okay. stick to 25 words although i can do it over and over if i need to yeah um strange fog outside guards seem nervous um Shoot, I think there's something else I had to say, but I don't remember what it was. Um, Motions in fog. Yeah, it's like there are things in the fog in the woods. I don't know what. Uh, if I respond, was, do I? Oh, sorry. Keep going. Uh, this, uh, I didn't get just enough for this feels like a trap or something. If I respond, do I have to use one of my own sendings, or is that included no, in the first sending? It's okay. included in the first sending. Yep. All right. I'll respond. Agreed. Uh, bog smell. Double opposite moons. Does that mean anything to you? Bog? Hmm. And as he kind of mentions that you can pick up now an undercurrent that's being carried in the fog of, of, uh, yeah, the sort of green decay, if you will, that, that sort of, it's, it's an undercurrent, um, that seems to be kind of floating all around, not terribly strong, but strong enough to notice. Yeah. Does Silas know anything about bog creatures or, uh, like I'm thinking, the thing that strikes me most is with, the, with a similarity to Mother Hydra would be hags. Does he know anything about those sorts of creatures or not? Um, I think the, either nature or a carnival would be appropriate. They will tell you different things. Well, I will roll Arcana because I have a seven in that and I have a one in nature. <laughs> I had a minus one in nature and rolled an 18 earlier. So. Natural 20, number three. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, as you start to think about it, um, there's no way this could be a natural phenomenon. Magic is the only way this could have happened here. Um, it is a merger of different, uh, of entirely different environments, and only magic would be able to accomplish that. Um, the, the double half moons is a significance because that does mean that there is a, a, uh, a balance uh, in the world where there's also an opening. 
And oh, you fuck. would know you would know of this because you've been trying to study how you might find passages to Mother Hydra. And this would yeah. be one of those significant points where something like that might be achieved if you had everything else set up. Um, so there's a significant sort of in that, the sort of crossing of realms or opening or, or availability, thinness of the veils. Um, there's also uh, a thought that occurs to you that if if the fog is is not natural and if the smell is not natural, then it must have been controlled or created from some magical entity. Um, there are a lot that could do so. You do know tales of hags um, who are able to manipulate large environments. Uh, you know of uh, tales of uh, other, other realms. And if that realm is leaking into this one, that might be an explanation for it as well. Um, but it's definitely unnatural. And you're kind of seeing signs of it now as you look around and you can see that, first of all, there's the swirl in the courtyard where this is not penetrating. There's also uh, the sense of it being uh, all around. But as you, as you kind of think about it and you, you take a few steps back and forth and do an experiment or two in magic uh, awareness, the smell is actually strongest toward the house. But the fog and the shadows are strongest towards the woods as if they come from different causes. A more specific thought that uh, comes to him is, uh, does what he know of hags match the weird shit that went on when we met the Baroness, where she seemed, there was, I'm trying to remember the exact details, but like she was behind like a thin veil, but I remember we got a bit of a, a Yeah, I got a glimpse of, of her hand like, and it was like skeletal. Oh, almost. Yeah, like a skeletal hand uh, or a smell of undeath. There, there was something there that, that weirded us out. I remember the hand thing. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that she could be a hag? Um. Or something related, like uh, just is it is it possible there's some sort of relation there? Thinking back on that moment, um, there was simply something. There was definitely something supernatural going on, something magical going on. Uh, at the time, it was explained that she was she was deathly ill, uh, and that she was uh, undergoing treatment, and that seemed kind of plausible at the moment. Um, you haven't seen the Baroness since then, so you don't know what she looks like now. But yeah. um, that sort of magical transformation, uh, hags are, are, are known for that sort of thing, but they aren't subtle. Um, once they do the transformations, they are definitely not subtle about it unless it is hiding. So mm. it, it's, impo it, it's, it's very possible that that's one of the potential creatures it is. You don't know enough about hags specifically to be able to pin it down. Um, but if a hag has moved into the barony, then that would be... Very dangerous. Bad. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, so Silas will prepare to uh, do his thing to pop up to a second floor somewhere, but he'll be he'll tell the others. Uh, yeah, I th I think maybe they're trying to bring something here. Uh, I think there might be a hag involved. Maybe it's the Baroness maybe it's something else uh this is a good time for bringing things from other worlds um i maybe this is less of a trap and more of a sacrifice or conversion or something uh i'm going to pop up to the second floor uh and uh yeah, be prepared. Uh, I think shit might go down. I'll respond. Great. Also, there was a feminine figure looking at me from behind the glass when she saw me, the doors opened. Why am yeah, I, I always think... involved in this shit? <laughs> yeah, I think that was the Baroness. Maybe, well, she's got the, they, they invited the heads of my clan. They invited you. What if they're inviting all of the I mean, we know there's several factions go, uh, trying to to control this place. What if they're trying to wipe out the factions while they do this? 
Um, and I'm thinking to myself, so the diamond must be here somewhere. If they consider him someone important enough to bring in, I mean, you're the Phoenix champion. You're a representative of Ignis. Uh, you're a representative of a strong power. So she might feel she has to deal with you. And I mean, my aunt and uncle are kind of representatives of Mother Hydra. I, I mean, I would not be surprised if whatever she's into, the Baroness knows about my clan. Um, and then he'll bamf up to a, uh, first he'll cast Pass Without Trace, uh, and then he'll bamf up to a, uh, I, you said there's no balconies, but there were windows. Yes. So he'll go like, say 10 feet beyond one of the, the darkened windows that he can see and hope that he doesn't trip over a table. <laughs> okay. Um, roll a d20. If you have anything that would influence luck, now would be the time to do it. Huh. That's kind of why I had made sure I had the rabbit's foot available, but I don't know if I want to... Uh, well, that's a reaction anyways. I can use that after. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have anything specifically lucky about okay. him. Well, your 3d20s in a row is kind of lucky, so let's... Yeah. <laughs> Rolling into the 20 would be good. Well, I got a six. Uh -oh. <laughs> if nothing else is added. Um, I mean, don't you also have inspiration? Yeah. Um... I might as well use inspiration on this. What the heck? Ah! It started to bounce off a wire to a 20, but then it rolled back to an 8. <laughs> oh, fuck. So Still eight higher it is, than 6. It is higher than a 6. <laughs> yep. That's true. So, yeah. The, the rabbit's foot is there if I need it, but uh, we'll see. Okay. He's kind of got his, his hand on it while he's casting with the staff. Um, what, uh, uh, whereabouts are you actually going? Just so that I have some idea. Um, well, uh, you can pick the spot if you want. It would be a room that the light has not turned on in a while. Okay. Um, so maybe towards the middle of the right hand side of the building, I'm picturing for whatever reason I'm picturing the parking area as on the right hand side of the building. Um, so yeah, like somewhere around with that one off, that's fine. Okay. So you pick this point, point you project your consciousness because you can't really see the entire, the interior of the space is nope. actually dark. He just picks a point and, then, and bam. Foosh. And you find yourself up against something hard briefly as you fall sure. away from it, realizing it's the ceiling uh, <laughs> as you were a few feet off the ground when you actually entered, um, you take one point of, of damage as you fall down, but because Ow. of the pass without trace, uh, it, it is uh, uh, silent. Uh, and you kind of realize you've landed into midst of what looks like a fairly well to do apartment. Um, I don't, I didn't have time to do the details of the second yeah. floor, so it's just really the bed that's there. But this is really a well-appointed apartment. So it's it's got a, a really nice marble dresser there. There's a, you know, uh, uh, a, uh, a, you know, a, a marvel commode. There's or a marvel not commode. The marvel, marvel um, um, wardrobe. Marvel. Wardrobe yeah. is what I'm trying to say. So imagine a really high-end hotel room essentially, and that's what this space looks like. Uh, it doesn't look like it's been slept in for a while. And you kind of arrive and you look around and realize, oh, this is probably a guest room. So it was a good, a good guess. Now, I'm going to go back to the other two for, for a wrap-up mm -hmm. scene for tonight. That's right. kind of been doing that. Um, as you enter through the main space, and I'll just move us back to the, the main part of the barony. Um, first of all, I don't think that either one of you are openly carrying weapons, right? No, I was Not convinced openly. to leave them at okay. home or at the temple. So the guards kind of lo look over you and, and don't really pay much attention. Um, they do actually stop a couple of people. Arwen Cartwright uh, was carrying a short sword. It looks <laughs> more ceremonial and looks like he's trying to convince them and it was just because of the costume. Um, but he, in the end, he relents. They give him a ticket, uh, essentially a ticket stub, and they take it off to one, one of the other sides. 
And again, both of these are basically they're basically cloak rooms. Like in any in any uh, uh, fancy place you've ever been to, this is the place that takes your coat and they give you a, uh, a tab. That's exactly what that is. Although doing it with weapons in the winter time, you can imagine they'd also be taking coats. Um, this is a fancy enough place. You can imagine they take the coat, then they clean it, so that when wow. you leave, you actually have a a a fresh uh, fresh coat that's been you know scrubbed down if necessary. Um, it, it gives that impression, but it also gives you get that impression that this place hasn't really seen that kind of, uh, uh, traffic in a while. Um, it, they are fairly high ceilings in this first part. They're 12 foot ceilings, uh, again with the, the sort of, uh, 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 marble, white marble flooring. Now from here, while many people are moving into the ballroom itself, it doesn't seem like anybody's directing you to go in there. So if you wanted to, you can take a look at the north or south galleries, uh, and I'll let you decide whether you want to do that or go directly into the main space. So we'll start with uh, Annie. What's your instinct? Verendel seems to be moving up the center, but he wouldn't. He would. He would follow your lead. Um, he's looking around, kind of. Uh, he's looking around, kind of surprised. And you remember the last time that you came up to the barony, uh, he came with you. And now everything was dark and dim and covered with cloths, and it was a very dour atmosphere. And you remember that the Baroness was was ensconced behind some sort of uh, cloths surrounding the bed. The Baron was practically having a, a, a sitting still fit where he couldn't speak. Um, and you can imagine that after that, since then, he's made reports to the Baron and Baroness, but he seems a bit surprised at what he's seeing. This looks different than the last time I was here. Better, I think. At least not so ominous. And that feels more ominous. It's a bit confusing, that's for sure. There weren't this many servants last time I was here either. They must have come with the circus, I guess. Maybe. Um, <laughs> as curious as I am... I'm just going to go with the flow of traffic, kind of, unless anything stands out and gets my attention. Okay. There are servants standing on the stairs, kind of standing like at attention, almost to dissuade people from going upstairs. But otherwise, mm -hmm. there's there's pretty much open uh, uh, space. You can see the hallways on either side as you're passing by the open doors uh, and the open stretch in the very middle. You can see there are paintings and uh, art objects in the hallway as well. So when... Um, when the guard had mentioned, like, that's the North Gallery and South Gallery, they probably actually meant galleries, not just uh, walking spaces uh, as well. Hmm. But you move through the main doors into the uh, into the uh, ballroom itself. Again, the band is starting to play over in the corner. All of the band has masks on, but theirs are simple. They are nothing more than uh, a, a plain white simple mask. Uh, only a couple of them have the mouth open. Probably those guys are going to be singing. Those men and women are going to be singing. Uh, but you can see on the on the faces, uh, the masks are are uh, half dark green on the on the right hand side, and half dark blue on the left hand side. Um, what about Medric? Is Medric going to wander, drag Malora everywhere, just... or go with the flow? I'll tell Malora. Uh, so Silas sent me a message that's somewhat concerning there might be some trouble here tonight and melora looks around weapon? melora looks around trying to f see where silas is oh it's uh, a magical message kind of thing she gives you a look um weapons do you think i can fit a weapon into this dress well, I suppose not. And she kind of does a half turn, and you realize mm, that's a pretty tight dress that that's not really yeah. if she's hiding hiding a weapon she's hiding it very very well Does not have pockets. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just, uh, if you see anything I, I will concerning, also... let me know. Yeah. Uh, I forgot about Silas's messages there. Um, I will also mention um, Silas drove his a couple of people from the village here, and he said that things he's concerned of something happening. So, just so you know. 
and uh, you can see the sort of well. It's mostly again because you can't see the face, but you can see kind of the head. And as he's looking around, and he it takes him less than half a second before his head narrows in on Odiga and Athanos. Um, I mean, maybe it was the phrase from his village, or or maybe it's just that. You know, there are odd people here. He did not have any trouble narrowing it down to them. Um, the fishnet people. <laughs> they kind of stand out. They, they really do. Um, and he, he, You tried. He, 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 he nods. <laughs> yeah. He, this is why they have not taken over the world. Um, he, he nods uh, uh, his understanding. Care to take a stroll first? That might be a good idea. Okay. A stroll, as in a walk or like a dance. Ne the next thing I was going to say to my Laura is like, we should go towards the direction where Virendil and Annie are so we can talk to them. <laughs> um, well, um, Virendil's kind of uh, pulling you back up that hallway and kind of off to the, to the, uh, the, the north gallery. And you can see there are several doorways here um, on the further top of the, the gallery, which I hate the fact that I didn't orient the map to north and south, but it'd be the west, which is the top of the map. Um, you can see that there are many servants there, and you can actually smell a little bit of food cooking. So that's probably where the kitchens are. Um, you see there's an open... Actually, I can. I should reveal that. Um, I was being coy by not revealing things, and I realized it's just going to mean I'm going to do time to reveal things. <laughs> Some of these doors are actually meant to be open, and I forgot that. Um, so I'll just reveal a little bit here. Because uh, where you are right now, you can actually see it's an open space, um, which is the... Um, uh, it looks like the it's a, a normal dining room. In this particular case, they've actually uh, put food there to eat so this is another place where people can gather uh you see a couple of people have kind of wandered in they're starting to sample the little bits and pastries and, and sandwiches and different things like that that are there um there's a few uh, uh drinks as well um and as you're walking along you can see these paintings on the wall um and i will have uh annie make a hmm make a history check uh no make a perception check let's do a perception That's 17. 17? Okay. Um, as you're just about to turn uh, Medric with, uh, with Melora to head towards Annie, um, you hear a, a, a cry of, of joy from the room, the main ballroom, as there's a little bit of flourish on the music, uh, and then um, the Baroness strides in. It's kind of easy to recognize her in the, as the Baroness, even though she's wearing a, a mask, as everyone else is as well. Um, but she stands taller than most of the people here, actually, um, mm -hmm. wearing this, this beautiful mottled green emerald kind of dress uh, that seems to uh, be composed of multiple segments, some of them that glitter somewhat as she, as she moves, um, and wearing a, a sort of triangular mask um, that has uh, kind of uh, a, a rough surface to it, uh, gilded again with, with probably actual emeralds as well as uh, green paint. Uh, and there's a, a sort of slicking back into these, this set of, of curved horns on either side. Um, and it, it looks beautiful. She chose dragon as her particular representation. And then strolling out behind her um, as tall, uh, is the now looking much more broad-shouldered and strong, having recovered apparently his strength, uh, the Baron wearing a, a round uh, uh, crow, basically, helmet uh, or, or headdress as, uh, as the two of them uh, welcome everyone into the space so that after the flourish of music and there's a bit of, of, a, of a clap. The Baron's voice is strong. The Baroness's voice is strong as well. And they, they welcome them in, welcome you in to, to share in, in the recovery, to share in the delight 
of the town having survived all it has, has survived. And the, the Baron says, and, and of my lovely wife, the Baroness, um, surviving the illness that, be, be, that uh, so uh, made all of us so distraught. And there's a bit of applause that goes up. Applause. And that, Cheers. And at that point, um, um, Annie, you're looking at this painting, and it's a painting of the Baron and Baroness uh, much, much younger. It had to have been done, yeah, you're, you're guessing like 10 years ago, maybe longer. Um, both of them standing there, standing proud, the, the, the Baron standing tall, the Baroness uh, sitting down, uh, holding on to uh, a, a young child, which you imagine might be Sable, actually, because uh, she is the oldest of the children. Um, and the, the, the Baroness's face is, is, is lovingly des, uh, described in the painting, uh, and you can kind of see uh, the uh, uh, the care with which her face was was painted, and it's 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 remarkable. Strong uh, strong bones, strong cheeks, um, and then you see uh, the painting of the Baron. Uh, again, uh, kind of uh, uh, square jawed, uh, short haired at that point. Looks like his hair was lighter back then than when you last saw him, where it was a little bit more darker brown, turning into probably a, a, a white at some point as he gets older. Uh, and there's something about the square jaw and something about the way the nose is painted that strikes you as familiar. Uh, and as you lean closer, you notice that the painting has been cut across the face and cut through the mouth. And so as you kind of stand there and get a little closer, you see it move ever so slightly as it catches a little bit of a breeze, which strikes you as, as strange. Someone has, has defaced this this painting in the home, and, and surely if they had noticed this before, they would have done something before anybody arrived. But there's something in the way that the paper or the, the, the painting curls ever so slightly, and it, it kind of changes the shape of the face just a slight bit. And the weirdest thought occurs to you is that while it's a painting of the Baron, it actually resembles somebody else you've met. Somebody about the same stature, a little bit taller, maybe a little bit broader shoulder, more muscled. Always had a stern face, a stern look on his face. Had very unkind things to say about the Baron. A man by the name of Gauld, who you met on the road right. some time ago okay. when hunting for the diamond. And I believe that's where I'm going to wrap up for tonight. We had a, a, a later start than normal due to technical concerns, which seems to be normal. <laughs> <laughs> um, could I do one last thing? I just want to mention, <clears throat> just after he teleports in, he changes his disguise to look like one of the servants' outfits. Easily done. Easily done. Just so that uh, we're ready for next time. Absolutely. So um, I hope you've in, enjoyed this session. We're getting back into things. So uh, thank you, my players, for your, for the patience. I've been trying to figure out how to set this all up for a while, and, and we're about to turn into the uh, the next step of this particular uh, party. Um, if you've been watching and enjoyed it, but you thought, what the heck, where's this coming from? Well, you can watch all the previous episodes, all 49, uh, at uh, youtube.com slash encaf1. We try to stream, uh, right now the schedule is every other week on Twitch, uh, 3 o'clock Atlantic time on Sundays. Uh, it just occurs to me that the time zone is changing next, or the time uh, uh, is changing next week, but we are off next week as we are every two weeks. Um, so we'll be back on our regular every other week schedule. You can also go to Watchers of the Drowned Dials uh, on Facebook. We are not terribly active there, but if you have questions or concerns or ideas or you enjoyed something, all comments are welcome. Uh, thanks once again to my players for putting up with a lot of description and a lot of delay in me getting my ass together to, uh, to get to this point. Uh, but I hope you find it somewhat worth it. Uh, yeah, thank you for running. It's it's my pleasure. Um, it's 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 been fun to, to look at this. So uh, until then, uh, I bid you all a good evening and uh, see you in... Uh, how do I end this? I don't know how to end this. <laughs> <laughs> Your system. I'll go to the end credits, which have the wrong date, I realized. <laughs> <But> nonetheless. <laughs> Oopsies. I'll see Oops. you soon. <laughs>